Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam peace and love his brother Ali still enjoying this podcast so very much today I'm speaking to one of my dear friends one of my brothers somebody that I just have so much in common with somebody I love so much and somebody that makes me know that I am loved and like what else can you ask for in a companion in this crazy crucible and journey of life than just somebody that's like, man, I'm not alone. Um, I'm not crazy. Or if I'm crazy, there's at least other people that are crazy the same way I'm crazy. And somebody that I love and admire and look up to and somebody who I know loves me. I mean, I could just hit the button and I could hit the space bar on my computer right now and like, that's it. That's the whole podcast. That's what this thing is, the Traveler's Podcast. People that we do life with, the mirrors, that allow us to see ourselves through the lens of other people. And ultimately we want our hearts to be mirrors for the divine. That's us at our best state is to polish that mirror. But we need each other in the polishing of that mirror. A lot of, I do anyway. And I think that the majority of us do. We're communal creatures. And one of the ways that we understand ourselves, we don't remember being born and we don't remember and we're not sure how we're going to leave this place. We just know that we will leave. And uh, speaking of <laughs> speaking of people that I love and do life with, I want to say happy birthday to my dear brother, Yasin Bey. Uh, this comes out Monday. I think his birthday is like maybe Wednesday or something. But uh, the great Yasin Bey, most deaf, the mighty most, it's his birthday. Somebody that I love and cherish beyond words. One of just the most beautiful people alive in our time. Uh, but he says, man, life, the gift, the peace after the peace and the pressure. Can't remember how you came or win a bet by how you'll exit. From the start, the only thing promised is the end. The only thing certain is the end. It's promised to all and none know not when. Yeah, man. Beautiful, beautiful. So special shout, a little side note, special shout out and much love to the great Yasin Bey, my dear beloved friend and brother. Um but, you know, our guest this week, Jasiri X, is um, he's somebody that I first learned about when uh, I think I learned about him when a lot of us in the hip hop world did. He started doing weekly, uh, almost like broadcasts, like before podcasts were a thing, before people had Instagram stories that they could just broadcast themselves all the time. Before YouTube really was a, a major reality like that, before people were really vlogging, Jasiri X, you know, in the kind of early mid 2000s, started doing weekly hip hop songs that were about the news of the day, where he would have these really beautiful, artistic, uh, funny, insightful, uh, takes on the things that were happening in the news. And you'll hear him talk about how he got started. Jasiri is originally from the South side of Chicago, but really became Jasiri X in uh, Pittsburgh, in Pennsylvania. Um, Jasiri was the minister of the Nation of Islam mosque at a really young age. That's something that he and I have in common. Uh, Jasiri is the co-founder, along with his amazing, incredible wife, Celeste, is the co-founder of One Hood Collective, which is an amazing grassroots organization that's just done incredible work um, in arts, in culture, in organizing, in really impacting and affecting the building of, of human beings, of people's lives and families and communities and culture. And they have had a huge impact also on policy in their part of Pennsylvania. You know, Jasiri mentions, and it's one of the things that I want to ask him about, he mentioned it before I could get to it, but they had something to do with the election of, you know, uh, black elected officials uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. And you would think that that would come from Philly, you know, uh, Philly is a more well-known, you know, black hub and black center. But the reality is that Pittsburgh has a lot to offer, man. The, the history in Pittsburgh is really deep. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to my man Hamza Perez and shout out to Wiz Khalifa and the late great Mac Miller. But the, the deep history in 
in Pittsburgh is is something that's really incredible. And Jasiri is one of those people who brings together the best of who we are, and especially the things that I care about, me being a Muslim, me being a spiritual seeker, me being a person that really has great aspirations on the spiritual path, and then also somebody that loves and appreciates and practices this culture, this art form, and tries to do it at a high level, and then also community organizing with the the real, the power of togetherness in peoplehood. You know, Jasiri is a shining example. He also, I didn't get a chance to ask him about this, but man, Jasiri was given an honorary doctorate degree. So Jasiri X is officially Dr. X. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we're brought to you as always by the Zakat Foundation, and we're sponsored this week by BetterHelp online therapy platform. And um Man, this is this is one of the great conversations, one of the reasons why I love doing this podcast so much. You're in for a real treat. Enjoy this conversation with our dear beloved brother Jasiri X on a Traveler's Podcast. I was just thinking about the time that uh Dr. West was tr- was about to introduce you. <laughs> Cause he struggles with your name. Like for some reason, you know how there's just certain does. things that just don't click. Man, yes. he was struggling and yeah. He was like, but he loves you. He loves you. He knows your music. He knows your work. He knows about one hood. He know he knows yeah. paradise. He knows like all everything about what you're doing. But he was like, please remind me the dear brother's name. And they were like, Jasiri X, Jasiri X, Jasiri X. And he got up, I think he was introducing you. Make some noise for my dear brother, brother Sirius. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A name I've been called uh as a since a child. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, well, I always tell people right. like when people mispronounce my name, I always say, uh, to people call me just sorry. And I'm like, I'm never sorry. I'm always serious. Like you know what I mean? So, you know yeah, what brother. I think I might have, I might have had that on video. Yeah, I remember that. I remember. I, I wonder was Rebel Diaz there because that sounds like one of them things where Rod will joke with me and never like Rod as a as a dude, he'll never let me let that down. So I think he might have called me brother serious maybe for like 2 years straight. <laughs> oh yeah. And then uh, I mean every time I see you on Instagram I always think, "Bro, my dear brother brother serious though." Uh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and then uh and then one time I think it was just between me and him but he was like he was just asking about people how is how is my dear brother Immortal Technique? How is David Bannard, oh brother? How is Ryan Fest? Yeah. He's like asking me about all the hip hop cast. How is brother uh Jadisi, J- how's brother Jadisi? I said, man, come on, man. <laughs> I said, it's man, so funny. Uh, I mean, that's close. in my you life. You're just gonna be brother Jodeci pretty soon. Hey, hey, brother. Hey, you know, I, I, I still. It's funny. Somebody was just asking me how what was the worst pronunciation. I still, I'm still traumatized by the first day of school. The first day of school would be a, tra- and I would the teacher would like get to my name and like just pause. And I'd be like, just, just, so I went by Jay in school. I'd be like, just call me Jay. Don't even, I didn't even want you to t- attempt to say my name. You know what I'm saying? So I had to take, well, that's one of my first, like, you know, like, like steps into consciousness was like taking my name back. I'm just Siri, man. He was going to have to, I'd rather you mispronounce it, but you're going to call me just Siri. But yeah, yeah. It's funny because we have, you know, one of the, our major events in Pittsburgh, you actually, the, you know, the anniversary of like the movement to get justice for Antoine Rose, a young man mm. uh, that was shot three times in the back by Pittsburgh police that was unarmed. We brought Cornell West and just, you know, he just united the city, man. And he really, you know, you know, here he comes, man. So much energy, so much passion came by himself. He didn't even have he had a phone where he didn't even have a, a piece of luggage. He had his suit on already ready to go. Take me to the venue. Um, so it was really, really beautiful to uh to have him here and to have him, you know, be a part of um helping to kind of, you know, bring our city together, you know, uh in that in that occasion that we really needed his voice. Did you grow up in Pittsburgh? No. So I grew up in Chicago. So I'm from I'm from the south That's side of I Chicago. Thought. Okay. Yeah. And um I, you know, the first part of my life um, and that's why I tell like, but Pittsburgh made me the person I am today. Um, like my, my given name is Jasiri, Jasiri Aranda is Swahili. So my mother raised me to be like socially conscious. Like I didn't grow up in the church more. So I grew up with a mom who was like connected to the movement. Um, and my father who, who left very early on, uh, was uh part of the Blackstone, um, nation. So like, 
when I, where, when I first, like I lived in the area, um, 72nd, 73rd and Everhart, um, cause I just was having these conversations. Like I, I always felt safe. I didn't, you know, I, I'm now realizing why, right. That, you know, because of who my, my pops was connected to. Um, I was watching a documentary of Jeff Fort one day and my mom said, mm-hmm. oh, I used to come to the house all the time. Amazing. And I was Amazing. like, what? So I've met some of the OGs. Um, in fact, I just met um, our brother James Blake's father, the brother who had got shot by the police um, um, in Wisconsin, um, where, you know, when the Milwaukee Bucks refused to play the game, his dad um, came out of the Blackstones and he was like, oh man, your pops was one of the one of the one of the one of the founding members, which I didn't know, because um, I didn't ha- I didn't have a relationship with my dad. You know what I'm saying? My dad okay. left, but we had mm. moved, and this is kind of just to set it up. We, when I was on 72nd Eberhardt, like it was like almost like an idyllic life. Although I didn't have a dad, you know, I had all my friends. Like I I have nothing but great memories about that time. Mm. But then we moved to an area in Chicago called Roseland, which was 109th in Indiana. You know, oh, it was yeah. the GDs, and and it was just a yes. lot more active. This is what they call the Wild Hunters, and so Wild the hunters, activity. Yeah. And so I remember at that point, like feeling like, okay, I have to, you know, how like how do I figure this out? This is different than um my 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 where I came from, and I didn't know. So at this time, when I'm trying to figure it out, and you know, I, I have activity right outside. It was a park right outside of my what my apartment building where everything went down, my mom was going back to school. So my mom ended up graduating from Roosevelt University Valedictorian, and my mom got a job in Pittsburgh. And so we moved, so she moved me from Southside Chicago to a suburb of Pittsburgh called Monroeville. So I I literally went from a 100% black environment to almost 100% white environment. And it was like all the things that I was, I was 13. So it was like all the things that my mother raised me with like that's they all kicked in like the first time like in Moreauville the thing that is the mall the mall Moreauville mm-hmm. mall is like the big thing so my first time at the mall we were called niggas like and I remember it was me my mom and my sister like thinking to myself like do I go try to fight this guy is he gonna try mm-hmm. to hurt us you know what I'm saying I remember thinking like I gotta protect my mom and my sister even though I'm the smallest that yeah. was kind of like on my mind and so my first day in Monroeville, going outside, I had you know fought this white dude. First day, so like, like a grown I go man. to school. No, this was a, a kid. So like mm. Monroeville, in, in Monroeville, the the, the the other like outside of white people, the biggest uh, minority. I don't, I don't really like to use that word, but um, was were people from India because Monroeville had a big uh, Hindu temple. So I mm. I get to I I go outside my first day. And it's mm-hmm. two dudes that's darker than me, you know what I'm saying, that are from India. So, I, you know, you gravitate towards somebody that's a person of color. Uh, and I've, uh, Jignish and DP were their names. I never forget it. So I'm kicking it with them. And a dude, white dude came over and started like, you know, he was our age, but he was like play, making fun of them. So he's, you know, I, I said, you know, how you, I'm like, man, why don't you pick on somebody your own size? It was like a little bit smaller. He was like, like, you? And I just, I was standing underneath this balcony. I just grabbed a balcony. I swung. I kicked him in his chest. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I'm down. And it was like, it was on. And it was like, I go to school. And you know, you know, bro, I'm light skinned, but it's like, so I would get the light skin jokes in the black, you know, environment. You feel me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now, now I'm in a a, a hundred percent white, almost hundred percent white. But now I'm black. And it's like, oh, you black, you that, you know, and you know, you say something about my mom. Because I remember dude said something about my mom. I, I, I knuckled him down in school. I got suspended. And my mom, my mom was, you know, education had provided us a way out of poverty. So my mom had b- became a nuclear engineer. And um, when my mom passed, I didn't even know she didn't have an engineering degree. I didn't find out till she passed. So to my, in my mom's mind, like education, college, this is what. Create creates a better economic yeah. situation. So she that's was that like generation. That's the narrative they were raised on. A hundred percent. So in her mind, if I fight in school, that's going to go on my permanent record. That's going to affect the college that I go to. So she basically said, "You cannot. We can't have no suspensions, no fighting." And that's how I got into activism. Because for me, it was like, okay, 
I'm not, what I can do, you know, Jasiri in Swahili means brave warrior. So I, I kind of blame my mom. I was like, you name me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like, like, I, like, yeah. I, yeah. I got to fight, right? And so that's how, it was like, okay, so that's how, so we started like a black club at our school. We got the school to teach a black history class. But that was my introduction to activism was really, I can't physically fight because my mother wouldn't allow me to. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to fight this way. And so that was kind of my introduction, you know? Yeah. So, so when did, when did the music come in and when did you start rhyming? So, um, my best friend at the time, um, got a set of turntables. Um, I, I want to say we were like 16 for Christmas and he was like, I'm gonna be the DJ. You be a rapper. And this is what I'm in Monroeville. Right. Um, and it was mm -hmm. like, I can't, um, so it's like, I started writing about what I was experiencing, which was like mad racism, you know what I'm saying? Like, and it was like, you know, hip hop, you know, for me, it was like Nas and Wu. And then of course they connect you to KRS-One and Public Enemy. And because I was experiencing racism, I connected more with that type of music, you know what I'm saying? Cause, cause I'm, I'm seeing like, I'm like, I'm dealing with, you know, like, like literally like white supremacy every day. So that it resonated with me more. So I remember my um yeah. my first my, my 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 first rap name was Pure Knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, serious <laughs> Pure <laughs> Knowledge. And so I, I wrote a rap that was terrible. Um, but it was like a it was about like my experiences as this as this black dude in this world. I couldn't write, you know, like I couldn't write about I felt like I can't write about Chicago. I can't write about I don't live there anymore. Like I'm in a suburb. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like I'm in a nice, I'm in a, like an upper middle class area. So I didn't feel like I could, I'm from Chicago, but I didn't feel comfortable writing about a life that I'm not experiencing. And so I just wrote about the struggles that I was going through. And although I wasn't good, two things really happened. One, people around me supported me, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't say, you terrible, man. Throw that no notebook in the trash can. Like they really supported me. And at, personally, it was, it became therapeutic. That like I could like writing about what I was experiencing was like therapy to me. Like I didn't realize I didn't know to call it that at the time, but it mm -hmm. actually helped me to navigate my what I was experiencing and and my high school situation. And so you know, like anything, I always tell people like, if you throw me a trumpet and I try to play it, I'm gonna be bad. But if you continue, if you practice at it, I dedicated myself to the craft of it. And I started to find my own voice. You know, I copied Nas for years and Raekwon and and then I kind of was able to find my own voice. So, um, you know, people kept telling me that there was no space for me professionally as a rapper doing conscious music. So I just, I kind of, I, I gave up the idea of thinking that this is something I could do professionally. I basically and just you know got a job. You know, I um I was a mortgage broker when I came out of college, which I, I made a lot of money, but it was morally, as a Muslim, you know, I I came came into the nation. Um, I couldn't. I knew I was putting people in bad situations as a mm -hmm. mortgage broker. If you ever watched the movie The Big Short, that was me. I was, I was doing the, the CD mortgage, all that, and and so I just couldn't. So I had an experience before I got like a you know I came out of college where I worked um, with with young people um, in a in a in a I worked for this thing called Youth Education a Scholarship I really liked it and so mm -hmm. I said hey I want to go to um, so a friend of mine said hey I know the person who is HR director at Pittsburgh Public Schools and so I remember leaving Morgansburg getting a job at Pittsburgh Public Schools and this was not only the beginning of One Hood but the beginning of like my career as a rapper, because what happened when I go into Pittsburgh public schools, like one, um, I I had to wear a suit every day. Not just, you know, in the nation at the time, I know we wear suits, but like mm -hmm. if I dressed down, I would be mistaken for a student. Like I remember being in the bathroom and teacher would come in, what are you doing in the bathroom? And I'm like, I literally work for <laughs> the Board of Education. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to wear like a suit to show them. And so what would happen were like teachers would see me as a young black man in a suit and say, I need you to talk to these bad kids and they will be right. young black. And so I start. So w what am I going to do? Ali, you get me in front of a group of young black people. Yeah. In my I suit. Mean, 
I'm a, I'm a, I, I'm a hit him. I'm gonna hit him with an L six ten. They was like, oh, what? So I actually started to write to impress my students. You know what I'm saying? Like, I would, oh, I got to, I, oh, they're going to go crazy with this line. So I'm I'm not thinking about putting a song out. I'm literally like, students is going to feel this one. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I had like yeah, a hip hop yeah. club. Yeah. Yeah. So this was kind of the beginning of it. I had a hip hop club at um, two high schools. One of the high schools I had a hip hop club at was um, Alder Dice. You know, one of the students that was a part of my hip hop club, you know, became, it was, we knew him as Cam. Became Wiz Khalifa, you know what I'm saying? Mac Miller was a part of it, and but like, like I said, so I'm I'm more so looking at what they're doing, not really thinking I was gonna do something. And so the moment for me came in in 2006 when I heard about the Gina Six. I remember, so I'm this is when you know I started working with Paradise. You know, you know Paradise. For those that don't know, Paradise is the architect of X Clan. I mean, he has a he's a he's a pioneer. He was the entertainment I mean, director at the Latin Quarter. Yeah, I mean, that Latin Quarter joint was so serious, man. Because once you start to... Serious. We had just talked to DJ Kenny Parker, KRS-One's brother, and he was talking about wow. Paradise. He just wrote a, a really dope book called My Brother's Name is Kenny. And he talks about the fact that oh. Paradise was the, per the person at the Latin Quarter and the entire hip-hop scene that we were raised on was birthed literally at the Latin Quarter. We think about Public Enemy and yep. Boogie Down Productions. And it's really was like, that's where the changing of the guard happened to like the, you know, Rakim and Big Daddy Kane and Queen Latifah, that whole thing. And Paradise Gray was the person who really was a gatekeeper in the best sense of the term. That like people that were yes. not from the culture that didn't have good intentions, they weren't getting the microphone, but Biz Marquee was, and Red Alert was on the wheels of steel, and that's so amazing, man. And that that you know, for Paradise to be the person yeah. that you connect L with, LL like slept on his couch, and it's like Paradise ends up in Pittsburgh. I remember, so like Paradise lived, so like when I was um, the minister of the mosque, it was in an area right outside of Pittsburgh called Wilkinsburg, and they somebody said, "Well, Paradise S Clan has a studio." I was like, "Wait." Of of who wait, Paradise of S Clan has a studio. They was like, yeah, it's right at the street. I was like, wait, hold on. So it's fun. So I, I I meet Paradise the first time me and Paradise spent any significant time together. I said we were doing the tenth anniversary of the Million Man March. It was called the Millions More Movement. This was two thousand five. Oh yeah. I had I think I had been named the minister maybe a month before that, and I said, hey man. You got to come to us to the Millions More Movement. He was like, oh, well, I don't really, you know, I don't, I don't really have the resources to get on the bus. I was like, bus, bro, you riding with me. We drove up to D.C. in my car. And at the Millions More Movement, he introduces me to all these hip hop pioneers that came out. And it was like, it was like we became inseparable after that. You know what I'm saying? It was like he was, you know, he was the most influential to me. I remember when I first gave Paradise, I had made like a little mixtape and he was like, yeah, this ain't, you got about two songs on there. Paradise is also very like straightforward. He's harsh. Oh yeah. He's rough. He's oh, rough yeah. on cats. Oh, right. Yeah. So he, so I, I didn't, I didn't like, I didn't be like, oh hell with you. Nigga. This is hot. I said, okay, well that's, so he began to like work with me and develop me and introduce me to different people. And, you know, so this is the genesis of what kind of became our organization One Hood. But also, so Paradise called me one day. And another thing about Paradise is he's a tech guy. So Paradise was also in his career, and he's hopefully writing his memoir um, because he was one. He was the hip hop guy at a website called MP3.com. If you remember MP3, yeah, you remember MP3, <laughs> yeah. So of course, if you did, if you did any rap stuff on MP3, it went through Paradise. Paradise Crazy. was the head of the rap thing at MP3. So Paradise is a tech guy. So he said, hey, he, he said, hey, just Siri, man, you got to get on MySpace. <laughs> you got to get on. It was Paradise told me, you got to get on MySpace music. And so I put a little MySpace music page up and I heard about a situation in Gina, Louisiana called the Gina Six. Mm -hmm. I saw people like raising money about it where six young black men were uh, charged with attempted murder for a high school fight, super racist circumstances. I found a Just Blaze beat. I wrote a song called Free the Genius Six, and I put it on my MySpace oh, yeah. page. 
And I that's when we it. all became aware of you. Like that was like yeah. that was a hit signal yes. for the people in our <laughs> section of the hip hop world. It was like, yo, who is just Siri X? Like it was like <laughs> the, the 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 new the new like CNN of the streets had arrived. I'm I'm gonna tell you what's so funny. I send it to all hip hop. Cause that was where all hip hop was where I got my rap news. Mm -hmm. And I remember a friend called me. I'm at Pittsburgh public schools at my job and said, Hey, your song is on the front page, all hip hop. I left work. I like in the middle of the day, I was like, I, I gotta see my song. And then I got a call from the Michael Bazin show. And then they played it all over the country. And then I ended up in Gina and I'm there with Mos Def and Ice Cube and Al Sharpton and our brother, the late, great Dick Gregory. And that's when I kind of was off. That's when, like, I had been told, uh, uh, Brother Ali, like, that people of this generation did not want to hear socially conscious rap music. So I didn't think of it as a possibility. Like, I saw a Mortal Technique was doing. I saw what you were doing. And it was such, but I didn't, I didn't know how, like, how, because you all weren't doing it in a traditional mainstream way. Right. So I didn't know right. how to do that, how to, connect with that with those movements and so like when i when that gave me that um opening i just kind of hit that opening and i started to do the stuff on youtube the this week with just serious rapping the news and 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 that became like my inroad to like making a name for myself you know what i'm saying but uh, you know it was so highly because by that time you know you tech you know what i'm saying like the you know were the folks that were really making like the socially conscious music that, that was like that was uncensored right you feel me it wasn't like remember you remember this was at a time we, there wasn't no kendrick or cole this was when the conscious music on the radio was was a little black eyed peas song and then where is the love where is the <laughs> yeah man you remember and that, that was i remember when they said my president is black my Lambo is blue. And I remember one of the blogs posted that my president is black joint and they were like, conscious hip hop is back. And I called, I, I called Technique and I was like, yo, did you see this post? And he was like, you have to stop looking at the internet, the internet this way, brother Ali. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, dude, what are they talking about? Like my president hey, is black, my hey. Lambo is blue. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you another person that was instrumental in my beginning was a a a a brother a, a rapper who also kind of emerged at the same time as me um was ny oil and ny oh, oil did a song called y'all yeah. should all get lynched remember y'all should all get lynched yes yo and youtube banned it and youtube banned the video yeah so they said it was hate speech paradise connected with ny oil who you know Folks might know him as Cool Kim. He was part of a rap group called the UMCs. But a lot of people didn't make that connection because NY Oil was so different from what the UMC. Remember the UMCs had like blue cheese and that type of song. Yeah. But he 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 showed me, because he was creating these videos. So he showed me how to use um acid um to make my own video. So NY Oil like showed me like you can get this program, you can make your own and edit your own videos. And and we collaborated as well. So he was somebody um, that was really again like a, a like a brother. Like saw me as a as a, like a little brother, and really yeah. helped to mentor me in terms of like how to create a buzz on the internet. You know what I'm saying? Because he had that buzz, and it still, I mean, bar for bar, I mean, I think he's one of the best. You know, like when we when you strip down all of who's famous in that, like bar for bar, and why. While oh, oil just a, a a dope MC. So that was my my beginning, my space in YouTube and just getting on there early enough that it wasn't oversaturated with rappers and creating these videos that what I was able to tell my story, you know. You know, it's interesting now that we got like, you know, I'm I'm good friends with Amanda Seals and there are like certain people. Yeah. My yeah. my son and um you know there are several people now like even if you follow earthquake you can see like these people that have this like up to the minute take like the, these hot takes on like when something happens it's almost like i wonder yes. what my son's gonna say and i wonder what amanda's gonna say and i wonder what there is you know just these people yep. that we follow even pete rock sometimes will post some stuff that you'd be like dang where's pete rock find this you know what i mean like the same way he was bringing Absolutely. records together in his production his 
he's like blending these like social messages on on his uh, IG joint. But man, when Chuck said hip hop is the CNN for the streets, I remember having a conversation with a with a local brother who was saying it could be that, but the technology isn't there yet. I'm saying this guy said this in the 90s. He was like, the technology isn't there yet to comment as it's happening. So he's like, you know, unless yeah. there's a riot or something like, unless there's an uprising and things are burning, they're not actually getting on. So by the time they make a record, it takes six months for that record to come out. And then, so when you sure. were doing those weekly joints, where it was like every single week, you knew that whatever happened in the world of like social justice and black power, and even like in the cultural landscape, you knew that Jasiri X was going to drop something. You know what I'm saying? And man, I looked forward to those and we shared those in our like change Appreciate and in it. our groups. I remember me and Lupe sending each other joints. And matter of fact, one of the first long conversations yeah. I had with Lupe, uh, we were talking about you and what you were doing at that time. Wow. That was really powerful, man. I, it's it's funny because I just met Lupe like literally like like a month ago and was able to have a conversation with him. And I was a little bit nervous. Well, okay, so for long form, like the first time I met Lupe, actually, he actually like ran down on a panel. <laughs> he actually, like he ran down on a panel that we was doing. We was on a panel. We tweeted. We were talking about him. This is when every Twitter was active. I want to say this was maybe right. 2013, and we were in Philadelphia. And he happened to be there, and he was like, "I'll be there in five minutes." And it was like, oh, what kind of energy he's gonna come with? But you know, he pulled he up. Came, he was like, chill. Share, share, drop a pin, share the location then. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And you do not up. know which he... Lupe you're getting. <laughs> like you don't know what. Like he's beautiful in 100%. all his forms, but you never know which Lupe you're gonna get on any given day. Right, because you know, Lupe is also, you know, Kanye just said it. Lupe is West Side. Lupe Absolutely. came in to. Lupe came into the music business with gangsters. You know what yes, I'm saying? So he like. Did. Um, but he can't, I and mean, his family is official and his block is official. And yeah, he is. He, and he is official. So like he did, it's funny. Cause now he's at MIT. I mean, it's beautiful. I, I just love when people move the culture forward in a way. And the fact that he's at MIT, cause when he came here, he can, you know how, like we had to book his flight. I was like, why is he coming from Boston? I was like, oh yeah, he's at MIT. So he had his like MIT records stuff on and you know what I'm saying? And he's just like, so brilliant, man. You know what I'm saying? It's really, it's really a cool, or am I like, am I, MIT is better for him being there. You know what I'm saying? Right. But, um, Absolutely. but, and I, and I, and I remember, man, like, um, I think like it was timing, you know, bro, bro. Like when I, when I thought about rapping the news, I was inspired by a, a rapper named Crooked Eye, who at that time had did like a, we, he made, he did for a year, he did a rap a week. And of course, you know, Crooked that. Eye is one of the, He's one of the most technically sound MCs um, that, that we've ever seen. And so I said, well, I'm going to rap the news. And it just so happened that the first episode was when President Obama got the Democratic nomination for president. And so I decided to rap the news at a time where more Black people were watching the news than ever before because we were watching history with Obama. Then the whole economy fell. So I remember like, it, it felt like, wow, like, I, I, you know, it wasn't just I decided to wrap the news. It was at a time where so many pivotal things, so many historic things were happening. And so, like you said, it was at the time and I had the technology, you know, YouTube had opened up, MySpace had opened up. I didn't have to uh, go to a record label or through a record label when that's how it used to be. Right. I didn't have to wait for like a record label to play or, or, or a radio station to play this song. I could kind of build an audience directly with the community. And so that timing mm -hmm. of it, you know, um, and like I said, I was early to YouTube where it wasn't, uh, you know, 50 million rappers on there even. It was like a new, like, I remember I was on the internet at the time where like the major artists, it was like, they look, kind of looked down on it. I don't yeah, have oh, yeah. to go on the internet. I'm yeah. so-and-so. And so, like, I was able to, and, and some of the old, older artists, you know, the technology wasn't, they didn't understand it. So I had mm -hmm. a moment where it was, I was able to kind of go on and kind of build that career. And I was really inspired by that Chuck D CNN thing. And I felt like, you know, I went to school for political science and economics. And I was, I was, I was like, politics was always an interest of mine, not to be a politician, but how mm -hmm. politics affect, like, our lives. And so I was like, I can rap about it. And then the other thing that really happened, uh, Brother Ali, is 
making a rap every week actually made me a better artist. You know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. I had to, regardless, like I'm writing raps every week. Like I had every day I had to work on an idea and thought and that like, you know, I forget what's the guy had the 30,000 hours or whatever. Like it allowed Malcolm me to Gladwell, put that ten, Yeah. Yeah. It allowed me to put so much time into writing that I feel like more comfortable now, like being a rapper because I'm, and I, you know, I was do, doing different beats. I do a South beat. I do a, you know, a, 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 a New York beat. I do a, you know, a LA West Coast joint. And so I was able to write on all of these different beats. My first uh, episode was uh, was uh, Jeezy. You know what I'm saying? I used Jeezy's joint. And then the second episode was Lupe. Um, uh, Hip Hop Saved My Life. Um, and then I was off. You know what I mean? One of the constant things that comes up in these conversations on the Travelers Podcast and really just in my life and for so many of us, you know, I talk to people that are just regular folks when they start out growing up and living life. And we've got dreams and we've got aspirations and we've got things that we want to do. We get these inklings and these like stirring in our soul of, you know, I think I may have a a knack or a talent or a gift for this. And then we give it a shot. You know, we talk to people like Chuck D who end up being in the you know the rock and roll hall of fame or we talk to people like Imam Zaid Shakir uh, who ends up founding the first um accredited Islamic youth college in America or we talk to Ilhan Omar who came from Somalia and Kenya and then Baltimore and then Minneapolis and started working in community and became a congresswoman or we talk to you know, Keith Ellison, who grew up, grew up with his father and mother saying, like, you have to be an attorney. And he became an attorney, but then he became a congressman. And then he became the black attorney, Muslim, black Muslim attorney general of the state of Minnesota, who led the, uh, the prosecution of all of the police officers that killed George Floyd. And he was able to get convictions, historic convictions in that, in that case for all of those officers. You know, we talked to Farrell Munch or we talked to Jane Elliott, you know, all of these people that started out with just some stirring inside them that I want to do something and we're blessed beyond our wildest dreams, you know. And so some of those people become, you know, uh, you know, they get a Grammy or something like that, but not everybody does. But all of us, when we really look at the journey of our lives, there's something that happens that's like, man, I never would have thought that I would be here. You know, our brother Jasiri X traveling the world with Harry Belafonte. And, you know, just like, what is going on right now? You know, and for him to create this organization. All of us, we've been blessed. This is the, the what I'm trying to say here. All of us in our lives have been blessed. If we really take this time to count our blessings, we've been given some richness, some wealth. Maybe it's monetary. Maybe it's not. For me, it's not. But... We're all blessed beyond our wildest dreams. And zakat is the reality and the, just the necessity of I've got to give back. Because if I look at what I've been given versus what I, what I give back, they never balance out. All of us, if we're honest and if we have this, this regular practice of counting our blessings and of being deeply grateful, you know, just this practice of gratitude. And that really makes it an honor for us to give back to try to do something about the fact that I've been given so much. And that's what zakat is about. Z-A-K-A-T, is a, that's what we call it in the Islamic tradition. That's what it's called in the Quran. That's what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, called it. So that's what we call it in our community. And Zakat Foundation is an organization that works all over the world. It's a Muslim-led organization, but they don't proselytize with this work. And you know they don't only help Muslims. Um, you know, Zakat Foundation has a whole program in Ukraine at this moment. And there are some in the Muslim community that's like, what are you doing? Ukraine does not have a good history as a country with like how they've dealt with their Muslim neighbors and their Muslim community. And it's a very troubling, tense history. 
But the reality of Zakat is like, we have been given resources. We have connections there. Zakat Foundation always works with people on the ground that are being affected and impacted. And they work in ways that are really creative and really humanizing and really collaborative. And that's one. Of, that's why we're so grateful to be working with the, the Zakat Foundation. If you go to their social media, it's Zakat to U S Z A K A T U S. Follow them. Check out the work that they're doing, or you can go to their website, zakatfoundation.org, and look at the things that they do. And I'm saying one of the things that's so important in this time, it really connects us to what we're, how blessed we are, and how fortunate we are, and it really connects us to gratitude to really to be able to experience joy when joy is so hard to find, to, to connect with people that like, I have something that I can share with you. You know, that $5 like seems like, man, for a lot of us, $5 is the coffee, uh, you know, our coffee or $5 for some people is their, you know, their addiction, whatever that version of that addiction is, you know what I'm saying? The little, the little treat that I give myself. But the reality is that $5 can feed somebody that otherwise wouldn't be eating today. You know, and I've been in situations like those of us that travel the world and like, I think that I'm struggling in America because I am. It's part of the reason why I live in Istanbul. But if you go to West Africa, you go to South Africa, you, you go to the Middle East, you go to Lebanon, you go to, you know, places and realize like, man, there are people who, if I buy these people, if I give these people a $5 meal, you know, and if I sit down and eat with them, I realize that like, man, what seems like a small amount to me is actually the, 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 a whole family will, will gather around a meal. And I realize that like one of the, this thing that I eat three of a day can easily feed a family. And it just shifts the whole perspective, you know, and it's really not done from a perspective of, or this like the, the energy is not like, yeah, you poor people. It's like, man, I am spiritually suffering because I'm disconnected from my fellow human beings and what life is really like, you know, and connecting with them does a lot to root me in something that actually feeds my joy because I become connected to the joy of people who don't have some things that I'm taking for granted. I'm out here stressed out and feeling unfulfilled and I, you know, and I'm I'm comparing myself to people that got all this money and got all this stuff, or at least that's the way it looks on social media or on reality TV. But man, to sit with people and to actually be able to share, like not only you're sharing your resources, but you're also sharing their joy and you're sharing the reality check of like, look what I have. So it's a really beautiful thing to be able to do. And again, it's not done in this spirit of like, Yes, look what I'm giving you, but the real bond and connection, and that's what Zakat Foundation is about. And you feel that even when you go on your social media, you know, go and check out my dear brother, Preacher Moss, talking to Muslims about what Zakat means for them, you know, and the realities of, of just giving and of sharing. Of it, It's a real practice of community. It's a real practice of humanity that connects us to ourselves and to the source of all being. So check out Zakat Foundation, find a way to get down. We're really grateful. We're really honored to be in partnership and doing this work alongside Zakat Foundation. You know, it's crazy because you and I are think I might be the only two people in hip hop that I'm aware of that share this particular reality, that both of us became Muslim young. And in my teens, I was one of the imams. And for a while, I was the official imam of a masjid. Wow. And you were the you were the minister of a mosque, of, you know what I'm saying? Yes. In the Nation yes. of Islam. And so it's amazing to me, like, you know, people are always like, man, that's crazy. You know, like people say, like, it was, I went to this show, it was like a religious experience. It's like, no, this is where I trained. This is how I learned to get a room full of people to the point of takbir Allahu Akbar, just the same way that y'all are saying ho or whatever it is, you know what I mean? But I, but I wonder like, absolutely. when I was thinking about the fact that when you were doing that, and then when I learned that you were a minister, I'm like, man, this is exactly what we were doing when we were delivering a sermon every week. 
You know what I'm saying? For me, it's like sure. every Friday. I'm guessing your joints were on Sundays at that point. Like the nation that has is full mm-hmm. on with Juma now. But like, man, every single week, I'm going to need to deliver something that brings together the meaning of life, who we are, what it is that brings us together, something about the current situation that's going on. I'm going to need to yep. make it relevant. I need for the, the 80 year old aunties in the room to feel it. I also need for the young people that just happen to be walking through, like, what's up with the Muslims today? Like, I need to get everybody yeah, on one accord. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, what better training is there? But how did you end up in that predicament of, of, being, of, Man, being, of being like the minister? I, I'm going to tell you, I never thought about it that way, but that is so correct. You know, to like that that thought is very similar to the thought of making a, a song. I've, hey, bro, I've never made that correlation between the two. And really like, you know, for me, it was really, um, I tell people, it wasn't like somebody heard me say some dope sermon and was like, he should be. No, it was a situation. I got registered in Chicago, which is the um, headquarters of the Nation of Islam. I ended up in Pittsburgh and it was really like, okay, he has a job. He got registered in Chicago. (laughs) He seems fairly intelligent. And like the community in Pittsburgh knew me as an artist. You know what I'm saying? And so it was kind of like, you up next. But it was like, you know, I remember because I was so young, it was a struggle. Because, you know, we got believers that are, like you said, man, they in their 60s and 70s, you know, they came into the nation under Elijah Muhammad. They kind of look, okay, what you going to say? You know what I'm saying? So I did have to study a lot because I had to show a mastery of it. And then I, I remember asking, saying to the congregation at the time to say, like, I'm a, like, are you all okay with the fact that I'm a rapper? that I, I rap and, I, and I'm and i interested in doing this, is that okay with you all? And them saying like, yo, we, we cool. You know what I'm saying? Like, do your thing, like, that's okay with us. But I remember having that conversation because I didn't want to, you know, make somebody feel uncomfortable. You know, it's all these different thinkings around hip hop music and it might be an older person right. that ain't down with that. People's like, yo, look, as long as you study and you represent this in the way we believe so, you can rap all you want. And I think like, as, as I grew, uh, people in the community saw like the benefit of me going up there and rapping and I got my whole suit on and a bow tie and I'm rapping and how particularly the younger people in, in Pittsburgh reacted to me. Um, and so I, re- I remember um, when I did the song around Trayvon and it started to be similarly to the Gina Six, it was like played all over the country and it resonated with people so much. I remember mm-hmm. somebody calling me and saying, you probably should reach out to Minister Farrakhan and let him know what you're doing. Because I never, I'm like the person, like, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be busy. I don't want to bother him with what I'm doing or what I'm thinking about. And so I remember, you know, sending an email. The, per- the person told me, this is how you do it. You send an email, you put your number on it. And I remember I was in Louisville. Uh, had a show with Rebel Diaz. I was on the plane back and I got off the plane. I had a, a, a voicemail and it was from Minister Farrakhan. Oh my. And I was like, oh damn. <laughs> Salam <laughs> like, alaikum, dear brother. Yeah. It's like people don't realize about... that when you speak to him, how cool, how very because if people artist. see him being so fiery. Oh yeah. No, he's he's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like he actually gave me artist piece. Like I remember like at the time, the, the this is what he said. He said, I want you to own a hundred percent of your music. I said, well, Minister Farrakhan just signed a record deal. I signed a deal, an uh, independent deal with a label based in Vancouver, Canada called Wandering Works. I said, I just signed an independent deal, but it's a 50-50 split. And he was like, well, how are you going to know how many albums you sold? I was like, damn, he got a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I, I was like, I don't know. So he was just giving me jewels as an artist. So it was, I feel like because he's an artist, he actually understood like and he had like grace for me not only as i grew as an artist but also as i you know got so busy that i felt like i I was never in pittsburgh i was never there on sundays and when i felt like i couldn't fulfill that part of you know he was also so grace for me and i remember like we did the um, justice of else Mm -hmm. this was the 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 advice because i'll never forget this we did the the I helped to organize Justice of Else alongside, like you said, Tamika, my son, you know what I'm saying, uh, nationally, uh, Carmen Perez. And, um, you know, he came up to me and he was meeting with the brother who was the imam in New York. Um, 
I forget the brother's name. That was a they 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 were friends for years. Um, oh, and, uh, yeah, um, Imam Siraj Wahaj. Yes, and they were having a. I mean, it was a bro. It was like a. a it's, I'm just you know you're at the table and just pouring in all this wisdom, and you're seeing that friendship too. That sometimes they they separate us outside of those rooms. You saw how close and loving the friendship was. And um, he told me, he said, you know, you've done more since you've been outside than you ever did as a minister. He said, but you're in the mud. He said, but the Quran says there's a purification in the mud. <laughs> and I just, I've, I've held that as I've gone, you know what I'm saying? I was like, man, you know, that, that jewel. So it was, man, it was a, um, I mean, the train to me, I use the training that I learned every day um, because, you know, in the nation and I'm sure, you know, when you're running, it's more than just the delivering a message. You got to make sure everybody's okay, the building, the, you know, so many other things that came into it. And it was like those skills, those organizing skills, I literally was able to take those skills into you know, the organizing that we've been doing as, as the organization One Hood. And um, I wouldn't be as effective as a as an organizer now if I didn't have that experience. And, and like, according to you, like what you just broke down, I probably wouldn't have been as effective as an artist if I wasn't thinking about those things from that way and then also kind of blend, blending that in with the music. It's amazing, man. There's so much, there's so much in that that, confluence like my whole life and and this is one of the reasons why I think me and you it's like the minute I met you it was like do you have the other side of this locket you know it was like <laughs> this is my, like we're like we're all like you know but the the way that um spirituality and organizing and and culture and art and all of it the way it comes together like these aren't different streams for us like these are all the same stream of the, you know, being connected first to the source of all things and then being connected to the truth and, and be trying to be transformed by it and help others and to, you know, be able to move things around and actually benefit people in their lives. Like all of these things are just part of the same stream or the same ocean for us. You know what I mean? And the fact that they're separated is really a crime. It's really a crime of like dominators that they've made it seem as though culture and art is different from spirituality, is different from organizing, is different from politics. Like, man, all of these come just naturally from who we are. And it's, a, it's just the way that you've been able to bring them together, man, is so incredibly beautiful and powerful. Yeah, man, I think like, you know, to me, what you just said is like that that overall like holistic approach to it but it it is like it's like this society feels like we have to label and separate things and i don't just like you said it's like that kind of colonizer mentality that even in even in music right even in hip hop it's like oh you're this type of rapper you have to be over here you and so it's like you can't even just be a full human being as full human beings sometimes you want to laugh sometimes you you know you go on a Netflix, you watch a comedy sometimes, sometimes you watch a drama, sometimes you might in a mood for an action flick. And like, why as artists yeah. can't we do the same thing? Like, if I just yeah. want to create something for fun, it's kind of like, oh no, you're you're not the fun rapper. You are you gotta only make music right. <laughs> that yeah. is like this, you know what I'm saying? And I, I, I always, I never, I never liked that, you know what I'm saying? Because I just felt like, you know, as an artist, you want to try different things. You might want to experiment. You want to grow. You want to you know what I'm saying? So I love how you put that. Like the like all of these things can exist at the same time. It doesn't have to be like you, to be spiritual, you gotta go over here, or to be artistic, you gotta be over here. And I just I just think that that it's like, nah, that's not we're we're made as encompassing all of these things. So why can't we experience them? Man, you mentioned earlier that you had early moments with Wiz Khalifa. Um, did you know, yeah. so I, I've known Wiz Khalifa's grandfather for like 20 yes. years being part of Imam Warthi Muhammad's yes. community. So like Imam Jabril was just like the, uh, an uncle to us that I would see at conventions yes. and things like that. Like I've known that man for a long time. <laughs> and then his, and he told me one time, my, he's like, man, my grandson's a rapper. Maybe I'll have him hit you up. And I'm just like, okay, whatever. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then it turns out like I saw, I connected with him years later and he was like, yeah, you see my grandson's doing his thing. And when the first time yeah, I met Wiz Khalifa, he's like, Salam alaikum, you know my grandfather. So, but what were your early, yes. early kind of uh, interactions with that beautiful brother? 
Yeah, so Wiz is, uh, uh, I think, like, sometimes, I mean, he has a persona, right? But, I mean, he's brilliant, right? I mean, he was called Wiz because of how intelligent he is. And so I remember meeting Wiz at 16, and, like, I would, conver- like, I'm conversating him like he's my age. Like, he, we could, we would conversate on a different level. I wasn't talking to him like, I'm, you know, you're, no, we were like, oh, man, this dude is brilliant, he's really smart. And I remember him. You know, at that time, he was like, you know, I got a job so I could uh, pay for studio time. He started going to a studio called ID Labs, and they saw his skill level. You know, so like when I met Wiz, you know, and he had the school afraid because of how 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 lyrical an artist he was. So I remember we did our hip-hop club at Alderdice. All the rappers did not show up because Wiz showed up. And I remember we played... Um, we played this. Remember, still tipping, mm-hmm. still tipping on four four. And Wiz did like a double time rap, to, and I was like, "Oh, like where I'm a rapper, you know? You come in like oh, I got, and you like, oh damn, this dude could kind of give me a run, you know what I'm saying? So that was the first time. I, so I was like, oh, this dude is amazing, and and I remember him saying like, I want to be a professional rapper, and me saying, you have the skill set to do that. You know what I'm saying? Like you are skill. Like just hearing you now. The second time uh, club, I did a battle. I did a, a, a thing of battling. So there was a rapper named Mini Thin. And Mini Thin had won the Rock the Mic battle contest. I don't know if you remember. It was like There was a Rock the Mic tour. Yeah. They had like a battle segment of it. And the prize was a pair of S. Dots Carters. So he had a pair of S. Dot Carters, Ali. <laughs> except they didn't have S. Dot stitched in them. They had his name. They had many things. Sti- so I, so he came in like, yo, I'm nice. And Wiz the ones that look like the old school the- Gucci kicks. Yes, and I wonder if I mean them probably is, but but Wiz in a freestyle battle. This was when battle we was freestyling. Destroyed mm-hmm. the dude, mm-hmm. and I, and I, again, and I was like, yo, like, you know. So you start to say like, okay, he's different. You know what I'm saying? He's a different type of guy. So I remember, but you know, it was some, you know, like I remember when he you know, start putting music out. Um, you know, Pittsburgh is also hood. Like a lot of people might not know, you know, if you know the Steelers, but Pittsburgh is a hood place. So I remember people giving Wiz some pushback. And then, you know, it was a lot, I mean, to be honest, it was a lot of haters here. When, when, Wiz, when Wiz dropped Black and Yellow, like people was like, oh, it's not Black and Yellow. The Steelers are Black and Gold. No, it actually, they actually are Black and Yellow. Like the New Orleans Saints are Black and Gold. Like, come on, like stop that. You know what I'm saying? But it was like when when the city embraced him, all that was dead, it man. And I just, it, you know, humble brother, you know, always like, you know, what I'm saying, like, never. He was never somebody that was like you came up to him. He was like, man, nah, man, nah, 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 cool, humble brother. His mom is a, is 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 a, is a beautiful sister. So, you know, has supported one hood since the beginning. You know what I'm mm. saying? And so, um, actually, um, next Monday is Wiz Khalifa Day in the city. And he's coming back to the city, so I'm hoping to even connect with him. You know, I haven't I haven't talked to him in a minute, but I mean, I just think how he handles himself, how he handles his business, man. Um, he's somebody that is a uh, um, somebody that I look up to. You know, just as how he handled himself as an artist, and then you know, was able to also meet and build with Mac Miller. Uh, yeah. May he rest in, in, in power. Another mm-hmm. dude like Mac, Mac like came like we actually like. Wiz was before, so like, there's a pivotal uh, place in Pittsburgh that was like the incubator of the rap scene. It was called the Shadow Lounge. So Wiz's success kind of predated the Shadow Lounge, right? Mm. By the time the Shadow Lounge came around, he had already connected with Benji, and he was he was already, I think his, uh, I think I forget what label he was initially on, but he was initially on that label. They dropped the ball on him. He put. Warner Brothers was initial label. He, oh. Then he put out Cushion Orange Juice, and then he's been in the stratosphere since, right? Yeah. Cushion so the Orange Shadow Lounge, the moment. that was the that was one of the first mixtape. Remember that was like online, and you know he innovated a lot of things. Um, yeah. So the Shadow Lounge was like all like it was a place where we all the rappers, gangster, whatever, all kind of came together and mingled one another. And so Mac was a part of our class of the Shadow Lounge as a young white kid. But always came with like a respect for hip hop. Always came with like an understanding of that I am a young white kid in this space, 
and always came with a high level of skill. I remember Easy Mac was his initial per- person, and then him becoming Mac Miller, and then him doing the videos and uh, you know, kid the, put, putting out the kids album. Like it's one like we like like with Wiz and Mac, I was able to watch them closely and like see all of the steps. You know what I'm saying? And Mac also another dude that was just you know so humble. Never, you know, it wasn't like I'm a star now. Never, none of, never, none of that attitude. So we definitely we missed that brother. Um, we actually this year got support from the Mac Miller Foundation, and it was a moment for me because, you know, I knew Mac. I, I, I you know, I have an email from Mac. You know, like let's get on this song where he was easy Mac, right? The first cover I was on, Mac was on that cover as well. So, you know, what I'm saying like. I, I look at these, I look at Wiz and Mac as like like brothers, but also like they helped pave the way for me. Like mm-hmm. when they when they did their thing, people began to look at the city and say, who else is here? Oh, there's this guy that's doing conscious music. So even though like I'm older than them, you know what I'm saying? They actually opened up a lane for me to be able to also kind of come out of the city of Pittsburgh and, and and do my thing. And I, and I looked at a lot of the things that they were doing with the internet. So like, I actually followed a lot of their leads, man. So shout out to Wiz and man, may, may Mac rest in peace, man. We missed that, but they just put a big mural up um, of him right outside of where the old studio ID Labs was recording. So we went and like did a whole photo shoot outside the mural just to honor, you know, him and his memory. You know what I mean? Yeah, he was just an amazing like musician overall, man. I think 100%. I don't think people started to I didn't start to realize I like I always knew like, man, there's just something so lovable about this guy when we first started seeing him. 100%. He was coming around. It's like he just was this lovable kid. And he all like from very early on, like you could tell. I remember when I first met him, I was like, you didn't skip like there was a time when he came out in like 2009 or so when there was a there was like a sur an insurgence of white artists that seemed like they went around the black community they just skipped all yes. that because now the internet was cracking white kids would start supporting yes. them it, you know they were in their bedrooms learning how to rap well and i'm saying a lot of them could like the technical act act of rapping they were very good at it and they just went sure. directly to the internet and suddenly and then you know because of that they had investors they had followers they had money yeah. and so people just kind of had to accept them because they were there but it you could really tell who came through the culture and who didn't and Mac was one of very clearly one of those people that understood how to interact with different types of people, n- seemed to really have a very deep reverence, not only for music, but just for culture and for mm-hmm. and for blackness. Like he just had a like a very deep, like there was something very sincere and natural, even in his body and the way that he spoke and moved. It never felt like he was. Absolutely putting on a, a a voice or a persona or anything like that. It all it felt very genuine. When he met with, did he talk about, did he talk about, because he he kind of reminds me of you. I, I wonder if he studied, you know, because you bring that musicality, you know, there's a, there's a soulfulness and, and musicality to your music, right? Um, and, 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 and Sim, I wonder if he studied like how you, your approach to music and how you, cause it, it's like now that I never thought about it until you just said it right now that you also bring that similar, you know, musicality. But I, what I, what I do like about Mac is like you said, there was a lane for him to be a, a frat rapper right. and he could have just kept doing that. And he yes. actually said, I don't want that. I actually want to root myself in the culture Yes, and think about different things and different approaches to me. So he connects with TDE, and he connects with Anderson Pack, and he he you know moved to LA and kind of rooted himself in a community of artists and yes. thinkers and, and 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 folks. And like you said, he could have just went and made another Donald Trump song and kind of went that route, but he chose to really root himself in the musicianship of it. Um, and um, I th- of course, to me, that's why his music still resonates with folks. It was authentic, you know. Yeah. I mean, when I met him, like he definitely knew our music and knew about Rhyme Sayers. He knew about Atmosphere. Um, he was working with Jake One. And Jake One is another guy like that. Like he's you I know, know closer that. to our age. Yeah. I mean, it would, you know, they like, yeah. And I remember Jake used to just, man, Jake One and Vitamin D and John Moore, who passed away, may rest in peace. But man, they, 
he came around as a kid and they busted his chops so bad. I mean, they just like did the dozens on him relentlessly. And he, as a younger person, that's one of the ways that you know someone's been around black folks. Like, do you know how to take a joke? <laughs> and then also, do you know how to return those jokes in a way that that you have to be just sharp enough so that people respect you? But yeah. there's certain lines that Not you can't cross. Like you don't want, right. yeah, you don't want to get punched in the face, right? You gotta be a little, you know, yeah. Yeah. Man, there was a super pro black family one time that I that I know and I was like at their thing and their daughter started dating a white dude and he came for dinner and it was just like, oh man, how's this gonna go? And uh man, they started they started in on him, just little little jabs and stuff. And at one point, uh and I and we're just all kind of watching, like, how's he gonna take this? You know, and 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 is he gonna know how to hit back? And at one point, they were like, man, you just sitting there looking like an old slave master. You know what I mean? They were called him a slave master. <laughs> and dude was like, well, why don't you give me a plate then? And we all stopped oh. for a second. And we all looked at the dad and was like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, he went there. And dude, the dad like just turned bright red and started busting out laughing. It's like, yeah, that's yeah. one of the ways you know, like, do do. that's one of the ways you can tell. And I could tell with him, like, man, you grew up yeah. with with black OGs and big homies and friends yeah. and like yeah. that, that joke in that Absolutely. like, man, you can't be a punk, but you also Cannot. can't be disrespectful. They can go wrong real fast. Absolutely. We talk about that all the time. You know, like I said, we, you know, we have a organization, Black Corners Day. We talk about those cultural things. And mm -hmm. it's, it's funny because we're in this kind of cultural moment right now um, that's, that's bringing out a lot of dialogue. We kind of talk about that a lot now. Sometimes people misinterpret mm -hmm. that like as black people like making fun of you as like, you know, sometimes our African brothers and sisters don't understand that like we're actually trying to bring you in by joking right. with you, not to try to like tear you down. That's kind of a, but it, again, it's like a black American cultural experience. So we also, we, we talk about that a lot. And those nuances are very real and they're very revealing. Absolutely. You know Absolutely. what I'm saying? Can you take a joke and can you respond in that? You don't joke with everybody the same way. You know what I mean? The, the you know, it, and and I could really, I could really see that from him. Yeah. And and um, yeah, and the choices that he made were really dope. Really grateful and honored to be able to have a conversation like this with somebody like Jasiri X because, you know, his practice of self care has been one that's been really inspirational to me. He's somebody that I look up to as an artist, somebody that I looked up to especially as an organizer, as a genuine, you know, servant of community. That man, we also need to understand that I I'm a human being. I'm a human vessel a body and a heart and a soul and a nervous system and an ego. And I'm, you know, a grown up child. There's still this child in me that had all these experiences and these needs and these traumas. And, you know, I come from people that have experienced trauma. So just that reality that I'm a human being and that in order for me to show up and serve others, in order for me to practice the art form that I practice, in order for me to do the work that I'm sent to do, I need to care for this vessel. And such a huge part of that is just being able to talk. And therapy is just one of the ways that we do that. But in modern times, I am a firm believer that therapy is a really, really important practice for ourselves as parents, as children, as servants, as creatives, as entrepreneurs, as employees, as family members. Like we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the people that we love to just take some time and dedicate some time. And I think that it's a, it's a really good thing to do with a licensed professional. Not because that piece of paper gives them validity that somebody else might not have, but you know there is something about coming from a community and somebody dedicating themselves to years of study and to being part of a community that that license really uh, indicates. 
that license means that this there's a there's a governing body and there's a community at play here that's going to hold me accountable you know that if i violate somebody's privacy i'm at risk for or if i ghost them or something like that i'm at risk of losing my license and my license is directly connected to my livelihood and my ability to practice this thing that i've dedicated my life to so it's not that the license in and of itself is validity but that license is connected to a communal practice. So to me, it's, it matters that somebody is trained and licensed. BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R, help, H-E-L-P, is an online therapy platform of licensed, accredited, trained, professional therapists, mental health workers who are available to people who have barriers. People like me, I live outside of America. I don't have an employer. You know what I'm saying? I don't have a healthcare package that somebody else pays for for me. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to figure out how to, you know, get, collect all of this stuff and get it all together so that I can have the self care that I need, the mental health support that I need, that I didn't realize I needed. And for people like us, better help is a, a godsend. You know, it's a really incredible way to access this community of, of therapists. So you go to BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash travelers. When you do that, that's going to let them know that we connected you. And so they actually, we get a, a commission when you do that. And you also get a 10% discount because BetterHelp, the way that they've spread is by people who have conversations like this one around community, around art, around culture, around the meaning of life. And so we sp spread the word and share this resource that is BetterHelp. You know, I learned about them on a podcast. I went online, you go to betterhelp.com slash travelers, and they take you to a questionnaire and you start with them by talking about what's bringing me to therapy, what type of therapist would I, li would I like to talk to. You go directly, you get to choose your therapist, you get access to their calendar and you let them know when is a good time for me to meet. You choose the way that you meet and then you just start having conversations and you take it at your own pace because also BetterHelp allows you to request therapists who have certain expertise. And it also allows you to, if at any point you feel like, I just don't know if this is the connection that's working for me, you just change. You just switch. No questions asked. No funny feelings, no hard feelings, nothing like that. So head to betterhelp.com slash travelers. Start connecting with therapists. I couldn't recommend it more highly. If from the very beginning, it just gave me different ways to look at experiences in my life that have been really healing for me. Like I didn't know that I had all these expectations of people. And because I didn't know I had those expectations, I didn't carry that knowledge into certain relationships. So I was feeling abandoned. I was feeling betrayed by people that I realized like I never even communicated what I wanted from them. You know, there was all these uh, experiences that I had in my life that were very traumatic for me, you know, and very triggering for me and very invalidating for me you know, pain that even with me being traveling around the world and being celebrated and being paid to do what I love for a, for a profession and people clapping for me and people telling me how great I am and people telling me that me talking about my trauma has helped them to heal. It's like, man, I didn't realize how much healing I still had to do and how grateful I've been to be able to connect with people that hold space just for me. This isn't my wife who's a therapist or my friends who are therapists or me going to therapy with my kids or this is just people holding space for me to really examine and investigate and just stretch out my own story and my own nervous system and my own self and my own ideas of myself. It's been a really beautiful thing. And that's why we actually reached out to them on a Travelers Podcast. We do not work with corporate sponsors. But this is one that I'm like, man, so many people have barriers. I that the same similar ones that I had. And I've benefited from this so much. And I learned about it on a podcast. So go to betterhelp.com slash travelers and see about it. Grateful to be in partnership with BetterHelp. There's this idea around being a community organizer and like building an organization and things like that that 
You know, yeah. so many people like fancy themselves. You know, my wife is a therapist and there are a lot of people that are, like get a whiff of therapy language on internet and then they start using <laughs> that language and they, and they start, you get people that are like, I'm an energy worker and I do, you know, but it's like, okay, that's cool. But then there are people that actually go like train for this and sit and they get a license and they're in a community and they yeah. could lose that license. Yeah. And you know what I'm saying? It means something. And I think so yeah. many people have learned the language because of the access through first Twitter and then Instagram and TikTok. Mm -hmm. Like you can learn the language of social justice and you can even become fluent in it to a certain degree. It's, a, it's one yeah. thing to talk about and tweet about something. It is a very different thing to actually be with your body and other people's bodies and mingling, yeah. co-mingling your life with people and navigating Absolutely. people's experiences, their moods, their backgrounds, their emotions, their mental health journeys, all of yeah, this stuff. Yeah. Man, what has it Absolutely. meant for you to, to really be genuinely, I mean, One Hood is an internationally known and respected organization that actually shifts the, the lived experiences and is sh shaping policy and is, you know all of these different Absolutely, elements yeah. man what is what is the what is the main thing for people who are are interested you know but but might want to follow in your footsteps what are some of the things that people should know what are some of the first steps for actually becoming a, an organizer yeah i mean it's interesting because i think like you know, we 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 kind of our, our our story of one hood is so it's almost like it's chapters, right? Like when we conceived one hood around two thousand and six, with you know me and Paradise, it was like six of us, you know, um, that kind of came together. I, you know, we definitely did not see where our organization is, right? Like we didn't we didn't see that far, right? We were just like, for us, it was like we wanted to bring hip hop culture into the space of community organizing and activism, right? Um, a couple of things that happened. It was a thing that happened previously, the, I think a couple of years before the hip hop political convention. And I wasn't there, but one of our founding members, Kahari was a part of, um, um, and this is, you know, how we met like Davey D, he was a part of that. Bakari Katwana. Uh, yeah, Bakari, yeah, Bakari is my, that's my, like my mentor. That's my, my direct mentor. Oh man, you just, I, just, I haven't spoken to Bakari in a minute, man. Please give him my I, love. Yes, I need to connect with him, man. I, will, I love Bakari. Yes, I will definitely, because cause he, he loves you um, as an artist and as a person. So I'm, I will definitely, because I, I talk to Bakari probably every day. So, um, you know, I think for, so we were, we just, we, you know, it wasn't like we didn't like the NAACP or Urban League, but we just thought like we were, they, they had kind of lost touch with, you know, our generation mm -hmm. and we wanted to bring hip hop. So One Hood, even the, you know, for us, it was like a, a way to say unity, but be cool with it and be hip hop, which is like we want hood, right? And we wanted something that we felt resonated with the streets, right? And initially, we were looking at, you know, our community violence. I don't like the, to me, the word, to me, black on black crime is a white supremacist racist term. Like people commit right. crime where they live, yeah. right? They don't say, like, oh, it's Istanbul, it's Muslim on Muslim crime. No, people commit crime where they live. Um, and so yeah. we, we began to look at community violence and say, can we use hip hop? culture as a way to bring people together so it started like organically right and we were you know walking the streets and so I, I, I tell people first of all like i think you have to intersect it like authentically right it, because i think what i've seen in this you know dispensation of time particularly as kind of social justice work became popularized is people saw it as a way to like get a following to get on like a CNN or a MSNBC. Like people saw it as a way to kind of build an audience. But what you'll find is if over the course of time, those people will come and go, right? Because they're not rooted. It's like mm -hmm. a like a tree that like, you know, as soon as a wind blow, if that tree's not rooted, it's gonna fall over. So I think for me, kind of coming out of the nation and coming into like wanting to use hip hop culture to organize, you know, that was kind of how it started. I wanted to organize through the, what do I love? I love hip hop. I'm a hip hop artist. And so I wanted to organize through what I love. And to me, I feel like that helped me not get burnt out. I saw a lot of people get burnt out because it's like, you're doing yeah. it, you know, like, bro, it's so much more. Like if it's just about protest, it's just about holding a sign and going somewhere and protesting. That gets old, man. I, and somebody has been a mad protest, Absolutely. mad vigils. Like it's not, it's, it's the, it's what you do after that. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's mm -hmm. where the work, 
is. And so like, but just going sometimes and organizing is tiring, right? So I think like, so I, I always tell people like, if you love medicine, like you can organize through that, right? If you, I know a sister who was a lawyer, she started, you know, black lawyers, you know, a movement for black lawyers. And like, you know what I'm saying? Like, so do it through what you love. I think it's one thing. And so for us, man, and then it became organic. Like we really care, right? So we just, we, we showed up, you know, when our community was in need. So like, you know, I went from, um, you know, I was doing a lot of national organizing, you know, because my, my music, you know, I was the rapper that was at the protests and the rallies, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we having a rally. And so I would connect with families. I'm going to be honest, brother, brother Ali, like when I wrote, you know, I was the first artist to write a song around Oscar Grant. I never thought mm-hmm. that I would meet his family and that I would be like a part, like Oscar Grant's uncle is like my uncle now, Uncle Bobby, says it be after. They're like my family. I never thought about that, right? When I did the song, yeah. a song for Trayvon, I didn't know. I remember, you know, um, 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 Trayvon's mom, uh, Sabrina Fulton, is my friend, right? Like, I remember her bringing me out to Miami and me feeling like, I don't want to rap this. This is in front of his mom. I felt uncomfortable, but she was like, I want you to do it. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, I mm-hmm. never thought that as a rapper, I w- it would connect me to people. So now when you meet these families, it's like, okay, well, I got to begin to do something to try to stop this from happening. You know what I'm saying? And so mm-hmm. it's like, it mm-hmm. came out of a real sense of, you know, love and support for communities and seeing people affected by violence in so many ways. And me, you know, you know, when I, when I, when I went and I was traveling all over the country, I would come back to Pittsburgh and I come back to a place we traditionally have the poorest black community in the inner city in the country. Normally, Pittsburgh's number one. Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Detroit usually are the three. You know, a few years ago, we were called the worst city in America for a Black woman to live. And so I felt like a responsibility. Yeah, I'm having success. And I'm able to, like, live my dream, like, literally. But I come back to a place where people are in need. So I felt a responsibility to do something here where I live, you know, similar to the work that you, you know, uh, uh, did you know, in, in Minneapolis, you know what I'm saying? Like similar to, like you you travel and you doing your music, but when you came back to Minneapolis, you made sure like that you were involved in the movements that were happening in Minneapolis. And you That's used right. your platform and your skill and your level, not just the rap, but you were with the people. You know what I'm saying? Of Minneapolis. I remember mm. for my first time in Minneapolis and hitting you up and yo, we're over here. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I think that that was what, I, so I would say like you, if you don't generally love the people, don't do it, man, because like you're going to get it's going to be hard days. It's going to be days where you get, you know, you you might feel looked over. You might not feel supported. You know, we were talking about it today. You know, I just somebody hit me up like somebody stole this woman's whole idea and they're trying to do it somewhere. else. So it's going to be that frustration. And if you don't have a genuine love for the people in the community, I would say just choose something else. This ain't it. You know what I'm saying if this is. If you just want to like a quick platform, you might want to do comedy or you can do something else to get a platform. You know what I'm saying? Well, now you can just, you know, you can talk on the, on the internet. Um, but, but to be rooted, man, it's different. And so like for us, I feel good that like we have a, you know, we, we have a almost now we're going on a 20 year history in Pittsburgh, you know, a 15 year history of being here, being community rooted. Well, now, now people know us. And so like, when 2020 went down and it, it broke, we got so much support when it finally was like, oh, maybe we should support a black male organization. We got this flood mm-hmm. of support from, from people in our community because of the work we had put in and people recognizing our benefit um, to the community. But I'm going to be honest, like, you know, I, I came back to run one hood in 2018 and I didn't realize how difficult I thought I could run one hood and be a, a rapper at the same time. And, <laughs> it's just, that's why I haven't put out no music. It hasn't really happened. You know, it's a job. And we work hard. And, you know, so my art kind of became the organizing that we do at One Hood in a sense. But it is, it's, it's very fulfilling um, to do it. But I would tell people, like, if you don't really love this and you don't really love the community and love the people, it's not for you. And the best way to do it is like through what you love. If you love painting, like you can, you know, you can bring your visual arts to the, to the, like we started uh, in 2018, the, the Artivist Academy. 
And it was really about like uh, providing resources and a platform for artists that are using their gifts and talents to do issues of social justice. You know what I'm saying? So like our, our lead teaching artist, you know, uh, um, our trouble in LS here got an Emmy for a poem that he did at the, at the, at a protest and somebody put a video around it. And so for me, it's dope to see like the connections that we have and us able to support artists and grow artists and then have them, you know, kind of be able to be professional artists and do their thing, um, you know, nationally and internationally. So that's, that's what it is for me, man. But it starts with like, do you really love this? And are you going to be in this for the long haul, man? Because it is a long, like we're, like we're established now. It took a long time. You know what I'm saying? It was 10 years of kind of donating our, 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 our time to this. You know what I'm saying? Before we were able to get enough support where, where you can say, okay, now like I have a salary. That took yeah. 12 years. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think like, yeah. I don't, yeah. So, but, but that, that you gotta, you gotta love it. You gotta love the people. And you gotta really have a desire for justice for our community, um, but it is a it's, a it's a long road, man. And I think the the last thing I'll say, brother, is like I had you, you know, I had David Banner, I had like mentors, you know, I I, I mm-hmm. can I can contact Cornell West, you know, what I'm saying I could contact, you know, I was able to have a relationship with Harry Belafonte, where you know Harry Belafonte took me around the country. My, my, you know, when it, when I would get the, the plane ticket, it would be paid for by Harry Belafonte. Took me around the country. You know, first time I went overseas was with, on behalf of Harry Belafonte to, in, to Berlin, Germany. And so like, I always felt a responsibility to the elders that like poured into me. So although I might want to go act crazy, <laughs> and you know, you had the moments where you want to just revert back to, you know, just straight of up course. street street mentality. I always had right. these elders that like poured into me. And, and 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 it was like that that eldership and that mentorship um was mm-hmm. instrumental as well, man. So it's like if you're if you're like in a vacuum and you're by yourself, it's hard, man. You gotta have a community, you gotta have support, you gotta have mentors if you wanna do this for real. And I and, and do it organically, man. Like but it is, man. It's, the internet has fascinated me that you can kind of just give yourself a name and kind of you can just talk on the internet. And it's like, you know, we come from the era where we had, okay, where you from? Who knows you there? And you, somebody yeah, might make a right. call. Hey, let me call you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You, you checked yeah, out. Yeah, we like... would do the ghetto Google on you. <laughs> and like, what's this person standing? And like, what's their... Like, yeah, what do I need to know? And yeah. yeah, we wouldn't go anywhere without having somebody that we checked in with. Uh And and that's what I'm saying. It's like now you can just get on the Internet and say things and it's just like no vetting. It's just, you know, you look good. You sound good. You know, you got a little flair to your voice. And I do find it fascinating. And it's it's something I think about and and kind of worry about, um, you know, in terms Mm -hmm. of like where we, we need to go as a community. But just to say, you know, to put a pin in one hood, man, like. The last few years, you know, we had tremendous success. You know, we brought, um, you know, hip hop into cultural and, you know, the culture into particularly civic engagement. You know, in 2021, we we were able to elect, help elect the first black mayor in the history of the city of Pittsburgh, Mayor Ed Ganey. Um, This year, we were able to elect the first black congresswoman in the history of Pennsylvania, not from Philly side, Brother Ali, where you would think it would come from. Yeah. From Western PA, Summer Lee. And so, you know, that came from us, like I said, like taking our hip hop culture, you know, we, we brought Lupe to organize the people. Um, and, and, you know, we had a, we brought, we had an event called People, Politics and Power. We brought David Banner to help bring the people, organize the people and give positive words and powerful words to the community and the people. So um, it's, 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 um, you know, like those seeds we planted, those roots we planted, mm-hmm. like fruit is sprouting now. And it's it's beautiful to see when you do all of that watering and you do all that work, but you know, if you stop after year two or three, you're just gonna have a seed in the ground, you know what I'm saying? And so you you gotta think of it as a long term piece if you're really interested in, in community organizing. You know, it's so amazing too that like it's 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 one thing to be idealistic and to be able to just become a master of critique. 
you know, to to be able just to critique everything. Like no space is safe enough and no no movement is righteous enough and no, you know, and because there's so much to critique in the world, but it's another thing to actually get together with other human beings and yeah. just even try to work with them. You start to realize, like you're you start to see yourself, first of all, like, man, I lost my temper with so and so. Or when people start, you know, having to pull you aside and being like, we were all in this thing and you just talked, you spoke the whole time. You took up all the space. <laughs> or like, you know what I'm saying? Or or, you know, uh, you know, so and so or when people start saying to you, like, hey, are you sleeping? You know what I'm saying? Are you eating? Are you are you okay? Like what what was man, I, I saw your son over at so and so. I know you were out organizing all the people. What's up with your son though? Or, or like what's the, you know, it's it it really is not only it, it's so easy to like spin out when it's just us True. and our opinions of things. 100%. But, you know, you know, to 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 really be rooted with other people, it does give you the the long lasting ability to yeah. to to do this for a lifetime because your actual life starts to become intertwined uh, with other people and yeah they'll, they'll check you i remember you know i'm a i'm a black man and rapper and i remember like you know being online saying misogynistic stuff and like dream or rosa clemente like hit me up directly like so this ain't oh it. man don't give so rosa clemente on your case either yeah. one of them man i, I yeah, yeah like, i've had like, I've, I've, <laughs> I've had come to jesus with both of them they both yeah. have read me the riot act yeah 100 percent. like and this god bless it. them for doing it a hundred percent, because it's like, oh, I, now how do I respond? Like, oh, I got it. Oh, my fault. Like, let me and 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 I appreciated that, like, you know, that love. You know what I'm saying? Because I I see that as yeah. love. You know what I'm saying? But like you said, that's Absolutely. the benefit of being in a community. When you're in a community, like yes. you can, you know, like you're comfortable with somebody saying, like, yeah, man, you wasn't on your, you wasn't a one today. All right, man, next time I yeah. can prepare better. It's not somebody trying to tear you down. Like I said, it's somebody coming with you with sincere love and that that those benefits man i think like and that, that's why i say i sometimes wonder as i look at kind of the the internet and in their action is some of that getting lost um uh, because like mm -hmm. to me like the conversation online is like the final product it's not all it's not every it should be the final thing right but if you're not putting work in on the ground but like i said I, hey bro you know how many organizations we've seen come and go start and stop yeah, you know, because like people got caught up in the moment. I remember, I remember saying to a sister, like, "What are you gonna do when the, when the protests end?" Because inevitably they do, right? Yeah. And so one of the things we started doing through Brother Ali is incubating other organizations. Um, and so like we help other organizations, like people that are interested in it. We incubate them. We help them get connected to funding. We help them, you know, if they want to do this, like we've had two organizations that we've helped get their own 501c3s and their board and now are established organizations in the city. When we started One Hood, our biggest pushback, and I, it, it was established black leaders, like they did not embrace us, Holly. <laughs> they tried to shut us down and it, it was heartbreaking. Of course they did. Because I thought that mm -hmm. they would embrace us as the younger people. And when they didn't, I was hurt. And I, you know, but I, I, I said, well, we're not, I didn't want to repeat that. So I'm not a person that thinks like one hood should be the only organization. Now we need, we need more organizations and more thoughts and more ideas. It's mad stuff that needs to, we need help with. And so we started to do that intentionally, helping other organizations, incubating other organizations, connecting them resource. If you need a fiscal sponsor and your artist will help yeah. you. Um, if you have a project and maybe you don't have the resources, we'll help you. And so that's kind of how we show up in this place as well is like it ain't just us we're trying to make pittsburgh better for for, for, for everybody um as well yeah It's been incredibly important for us on the Travelers Podcast and at Travelers Media to just be for real independent 
And that really requires that we grow our connection together. I think social media seems like that connection because of the fact that you can go and look up, you know, whoever you follow, whoever you're interested in, and you can see what they're eating and you can see where they're going and you can message them. And I like to message people back and it feels like we're connecting. But the reality is that that platform, whichever one you use to connect, those are major corporations. And those are major media outlets. They're huge global media outlets. That's what they really are. And so it feels like it's not just TV. It feels like it's not Clear Channel or it feels like it's not you know, a, a major network, but it absolutely is. And even if you follow me, even if you follow your favorite artists or creatives or organizers or activists or whatever, whoever you're following, these, these platforms are doing a lot to curate what you see based on their bottom line. And so a lot of times it feels like you're directing it. It feels like the creators are, are in the driver's seat, but we're absolutely not. I know for a fact that there's times that I put certain things out that I know the people that listen to me, that follow me, that support me, I know they want to hear it and they're just not hearing it because of who knows what else is going on in the world of Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, who, whatever you're using. These are major corporations and they're using this kind of like blanket catch-all term that we call the algorithm or AI or whatever. They're, they're setting up their business to work for what's best for them. So I say all that to say, we really need to be connecting with each other on our on direct, as direct communication as we possibly can. I say that to say, go to brotherali.com because that's our actual platform. You can find my whole, you can find all kinds of videos there, like the interviews and things like that, that I like. Uh, you can find the bio that me and my crew actually put together. It's actually a collection of different bios that people have written about me over the years and things people have said about me. Um, but you can, uh, if you want to holler at me about uh, inviting me to speak, inviting me to perform, if you want to see what's up with, you know, getting a beat, if you want to get a, a verse or a feature, uh, if you want to be on the podcast, if you want to, you know, all of that stuff, There's there. that's the channels to do that. Also, you can see my whole catalog and, you know, me and my crew actually wrote little write-ups and like backstories on different parts of our catalog. A lot of people don't know, for example, that we have a whole series of tour songs, like tour theme songs that I've done. It's been one of the things that I've done as a theme in my career. And you can see the through line of those, the ones that I did, early ones I did with Evidence and other, other people that we've toured with, you know, and also... You can see all of our merch. You can get our drops. You know, we've got a, a online learning series that we do. Uh, we just we still have a cohort that's that's not closed yet for Blood on Beats, which is our month long intensive, really interactive, like deeply personal songwriting workshop that we do uh, once a year. You know, where we bring people in and we spend an entire month really engaging together. We've got like you know class time where we're live together. But then also there's a Slack channel throughout the month where we're really writing songs together and we're really building community and dealing with everything from the basic nuts and bolts of writing songs to the spiritual aspects of like pouring out ourselves in these songs and really doing it together. So that's where you connect with those. Uh, there's a mailing list where you can hear from us directly. I do not blow you up. I don't spam you. I don't sell your information. I write them myself. It's not like a gener computer generated thing to just tell you every single time I post something, but it's like really when I have something I want to share with you. Um, the limited releases that we do, we do these like short releases where only press 300 copies of something or 200 copies of something. And it's like, I just want to release this and have a group experience with the people that are paying attention right now. So all this stuff. But we also have a, a section called The Caravan. So if you go to brotherali.com and go to the, the tab called Join, you'll see that we've got real community in there. Uh, and there's different levels and different ways of engaging. But we've got one called The Trailblazers in our caravan of travelers together where we're communicating with each other on a regular basis. It's a really intimate group of people, um, you know, and also, you know, they really support what we do. But whenever we drop something, 
you know what I'm saying? Or whenever we're offering something, they get it as a gift because of their support. But also we've got a Slack channel in there that goes year round where people are sharing, you know, really intimate experiences of going to visit their family uh, or if, you know, family members dying or stress or that they're, what we're having with our children or problems that we're facing at work or, you know, struggles we're having with our identity and with our lived experience. And there's people in there because people, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got fans that are, are listeners, supporters that are really seriously traditionally practicing Orthodox Muslims who only eat halal meat and who are very insular communities a lot of the time. And then I've got people that are activists, organizers that are, you know what I'm saying, from from different uh, communities with different identities. These people would never know each other, but it's an extension of the podcast where like, I'm blessed to share life and be accepted by these different and embraced by these different walks of life, these different communities. And so people are connecting and really sharing very, very personal things together. So I just say all that to say, go to brotherali.com, check it out. That's how we're really going to stay connected to each other, regardless of who buys what platform and what their new algorithm is or all this other mess. We're here to be with you and we want to be directly connected to you. So go to brotherali.com, get down with the caravan, get down with the whole thing we're doing. You know, another thing that me and you really share is like anybody that knows us, like, you know, anybody that knows you, even if they haven't met her yet, they know about your wife. And I'm the same way. Anybody that talks to me (laughs) for 10 minutes is going to know my wife's from the Bronx. My wife's the therapist. She's the, she did this, she did that. She said this, she said that. And it's funny because like, she's, my wife's very private. So I don't know if, if your wife's name is known. So I'm yes. gonna say her name, and if you want me to take it out, I will. I actually, Fair we enough. actually just, I, 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 yeah, I thought so. But we muted. My wife has specifically asked me, like, don't say my name. I don't want to, gotcha. you know, because my wife is a community is a community mental health person, and so yeah. sometimes she's assisting people who my my, my wife would. They're want, talking my, to her about something that happened with. Yeah, mm. Celeste would want like a little like air horn after her name like it said she would want like it, she would <laughs> want so. it to be scratched so. So, so 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 she like it's like she's the she, <laughs> she's, <laughs> 100%. Blocko, blocko, blocko. yeah she's actually <laughs> yeah. like the extrovert like i'm i'm the introvert in our in our relationship like a lot of people think because i'm an artist they think that i'm a i'm i'm not really an outgoing person i'm a very private person i'm a very reserved person she's the extrovert yeah. so i always tell people like uh in pittsburgh i'm like people know me but they love her that's a difference. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They know me. They know of me. And all that's just serious. But people love my wife. Like, there's a they, they love yeah. her. And, and because, she, you know, how she shows up. She always shows up with care and concern for the community. You know, if, if, if you got to go fund me, my wife, don't, you know, and she tell me after the fact. She, <laughs> oh, yeah. We Dude, gave, uh, same, so-and-so same. To this you know what's crazy is our wives <laughs> have never met in person. Like, they've never met in person, but they're so aligned like they're yeah. dear friends <laughs> they're dear yes. friends like i don't know they message each other i don't even know how they talk Absolutely. but she's Absolutely. always just like oh celeste celeste and jasiri were just doing so and so i think she told me she was like yeah i think they just had like y'all have been together around the same amount of time yeah yeah man yeah, do, yeah. Am, am i right in thinking that like for some somehow i got the idea that or the impression that celeste when you were doing your thing as an artist that she went to school to learn artist uh, yeah. management Yes. So that's what she did. Yeah. So she saw that like she's essentially like, you know, I mean, she if you're doing something and she can help you like she's like that with everybody. But she saw me as an artist and she and that was the pivotal moment um, in in my career and and the, the establishment of One Hood. So she went and she had like an associate's degree. She went and got her degree in arts management uh, from Chatham University and she started to manage me. And, you know, because, you know, bro, I'm, you, you asked me to come and, you know, hey, man, we ain't got no money, but we and I would be showing up and she's looking at the bills. My wife handles the bills in our house. She's she's the person that's more financially. I'm an artist, man. I just be doing my me, thing. Me too. So she was yeah, like, nah, we got to start asking these people for contracts. And, you know, you you show up to the community event. Oh, brother, I know we said a thousand, but, you know, we only got. 300 at the door. I hope you understand. I'd be like, oh, that's okay. And then she like, bro, what rents do? Yeah, but brother? I spent like, 700 you- <laughs> to get here. 
<laughs> like, what is yeah. he doing? So she, when she started to manage me, you know, it like that's when I really started to grow, particularly financially as an artist, man. And then when she when she started to run one hood, she actually made it a, like me and Paradise had this idea of it. And we did classes and stuff. We didn't know how to run we didn't know how to run no whole organization. And she really built it up and built these collaborations to the point where she did so well that, you know, now she works in philanthropy. She's a senior program officer for arts and culture at the Pittsburgh Foundation. And she does a lot of stuff nationally with arts philanthropy, with like grant makers in the arts. She's on all of these different boards. And so like, but that came from like her seeing me and wanting to help build my career. And now, you know, she's a, she's a, she's a giant in her field, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and able to help so many more artists besides mm-hmm. myself and meeting with artists and connecting them to, to grant funding. And, you know, um, so yeah, she, she manages a, um, a thing called Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh. And, you know, so she's, like I said, she's able to help so many other artists besides myself. And that's, that's what she loves. So yeah, so she's like, she's blown up, man. And, um, but I, I think it kind of showed like similar, like how, if you, if you authentically like approach something, like with a real desire just to help, you'll be amazed at how the universe will like elevate you and put you in places and rooms that you never thought about because that wasn't your intention. Your intention wasn't to like, my intention wasn't like when I wrote Free to Gina 6, I didn't didn't think that it was going to be played around the country. I just wanted to tell the story of these young people, right? When people tried to give, people wanted to buy the song. And I was like, I can't make money off of these. This is not my story. This is their story. This is their pain and trauma. I can't make money off their trauma. Like that didn't even make sense to me that people, but you know, this capitalism, man, they like, yo, the song is hot. And I just couldn't do that. So I think like, if you have that genuine care and love and you approach things like that, that the universe mm-hmm. is made in a way, right? Is, you know, is, is built in a way where it will it will support you, love you, grow you, and it's been amazing to watch her journey. Um, and it, it's funny because, like, I'm gonna talk a little shit on her real quick, if you don't mind. Go ahead, um, go ahead. You know, talk when that I when, talk, brother. When, hey, bro, when I start traveling and doing all these meetings and stuff, she would be kind of a little tight. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, you traveling, you doing all this stuff. Who are you meeting with? Why are you meeting with them? And they'd be like, well, they're you know that that. Now, this, what, what does she do now? Travel and meetings, you know what I mean? So it was like, until she, and, and she, but you know, she's humble. She was like, yo, look, I understand now. Cause she's traveling and meeting all over the world and the country. So now we got to organize our schedules. So it is cool, man. I, I love it. And I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy for, for many years. And, and I'm, I'm going to say this, this is a real rap. You know what I'm saying? For many years, people like, she was, she was like just series white. Although she was so much more and, 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 you know, she has such more of an impact on my career because you see me, you mm-hmm. think I'm the power because you see me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this mm-hmm. is many times it's like, no, but the power is behind me. You know what I'm saying? That's the right. power. That's right. And so like, I'm, right. I, I love the fact that now she's very visible and like the, the world can see what I've been seeing for years. And that people can see the value that she brings. So I just, I love sitting back. And we were just at an event in, in, in New York. And, you know, and I, I was I was Celeste's husband. I'm Celeste's husband. <laughs> like, I love that. It's I'm dope, like, yeah, no, I'm just her husband. I'm just over here chilling. Don't you mind me. So it is beautiful to see that happen. And um, yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed. And I'm happy that, you know, that, that that's my wife, you know. You seem to like you and her seem to have like a really dope, at least from what we see, like self care thing. Like it seems like you guys make time to travel together. Like I've just see, I just see y'all. So it yeah. feels like often with so that, like that sand or, and sand yeah. and water in the backdrop. It sound it seems like and 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 me and my wife are always so happy. It's like yo, did you see Jasiri and Celeste? <laughs> you know what I mean? They're, they're they're at some beach somewhere, just be, hey. being beautiful. I come from a generation where it was like, we, we work. I, I, that's one of the things I love right. about this generation is the idea of self-care and time because I grew up in it. Like we grind, we work, we hustle, you know, I, my, I, you know, I was a latchkey kid, man. My mom was working. And so like, mm-hmm. I take on that, like, you know, she makes, she makes me take off my birthday. Like in my mind, this is another, I'm working. 
like so I kind of so she she really put that in me like no you need to take time she was the one that kind of came to me and was like you know I lost my mom and I had a really really hard time I grew up in a single parent household and when my mom moved us to Pittsburgh it was me and my mom and my sister my mom was my only I didn't have like grandparents that I really knew I have an uncle but we're not really close it was mom so when my mom passed I was struggling um, I didn't know that, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, I, again, I come from a suck it up and work. And so she yeah. really was like, oh, you need therapy. You need to talk to somebody. And I was always the, man, I ain't telling no other man about that. But, but, you know, first time I went to therapy, I just broke down. You know what I'm saying? I had all this yeah. stuff bottled mm. up in me. I just mm. pushed it all down. Mm. It all came up. And And mm. so that's really her, you know, saying like, you know, we got to take it. So now we have on our schedule, like, this is our vacation with us. We're about to do our children, our family vacation in, in, in a couple of weeks. So like, but that was really her. I, you know, I, I never, I'm like, we work. I'm, I'm on here like, I work. So she'd be making me take days off. She was like, boy, if I could throw your phone. And <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, man. So I, again, that's like that partner, that's the community, right? That's, you know, in, in, in a sense, like that's what the marriage is, right? somebody that knows you more intimately than anybody else that can help okay i see this is a fault that you have right you you don't turn off so i can help you know you're going to disconnect now and we're going to disconnect you know what i'm saying you know because like what happened is because i work that way then that's how my staff work because they see me working that way you know what i'm saying so then she got to come in and say no culture <laughs> we got to have some therapy so she actually created a program where like Every like if you have an artist or work with us, you get therapy. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to come out of your pocket. So that's really was her because I, you know I'm just a person of like I work, I work, I work, I work. But I always I also realize that that is not a sustainable mentality. And in and, and many ways, man, you know through therapy, I learned like oh, this is how I was taught. It wasn't that it was the right, right. way. It was just that's what I saw. Right. And that's what I was right. taught. So then I assumed that's the right way because that's how yeah. I was brought up culturally. And so, yeah. yeah, so I'm so I'm still working on it, man. I still, you know, I did a I did one meeting on the over the vacation. I wasn't supposed to do. <laughs> but it was only one this time, you feel me? So I'm 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 yeah. working on it. But I appreciate like having, you know, like picking somebody that like is willing to work with you through those difficult times. That's what, you know, it was controversial because like Michelle Obama had made a statement about, you know, relationships and, you know, that sometimes it's, and, and, you know, it's like people, people like push back on that. Oh, what are you talking about? Sometimes it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah, man. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes, you know, you go through these stretches where it might be some, but it's like, if you're committed to, you know, that partnership, you work through it. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. so I'm I'm ha- happy that I have a partner who's willing to work through, you know, these different this, you know, me being at me, me going out and just tr- doing that thing and, and willing to help me. And so we're, you know, we're like that team. Um uh, and, and so, you know, I'm co founder of one of the media. And she is the other co founder, you know what I'm saying? And it's like it wouldn't be where it is without the collective of both of us. You know what I'm saying? So absolutely. Man, it's a beautiful thing, man. I got a million things I could ask you about. You've already been so generous <laughs> with your time, but man. Man, I mean, you know, we, just, we, could, we could talk. I got a million things I want to ask, you know, how you got the Istanbul. It's, yeah. it's so many. But we'll, we'll talk, brother. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, because I, I feel like you're, you know, you're so, um, you know, you have so many dispensations like your growth is so amazing, right? Um, artistically, right? From battle rapper to, you know, producing these songs to like make, doing, making major, major records to like, you know, being blackballed in a, you know what I'm saying? Like you've had so many things that you were able to like work through, but work and work through them all to now, you know, being and being overseas and, you know how how Islam has been that through line to kind of help you, but now you know you went to you know university to study more, like, and I just I feel like you know the way we talk about rappers is such a limiting thing, 
And I, I think like yeah. your story helps to like open people's minds up to like your fullness as to, to call you a rapper is really like, you know, it's like you're so much, well, that's where you began. You know what I'm saying? It was like mm. rapper is a vehicle, but it's not you and your totality. So I would love to have a conversation with you similar to like what we did back in the day um, to do another one because yeah. I think, that was and so I don't know, fresh, are, you, man. are you, are you, are you, doing a documentary about yourself or memoirs about yourself? Are you thinking about that? We've talked about, uh, we've talked about a memoir. Yeah. Um, so Brent, Brendan, who's the producer of the podcast is also my partner now. Okay. So we, we actually started a company during the pandemic around the time that I moved. Yeah. So I'm totally independent now with, with all love and respect to the rhyme series label that I was on for 20 years. Yeah. But it just was like time for me to. Oh, I didn't know, know that. That's dope. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my catalog is still there and it's still complete love and everything, but it's just like, man, at some point it's like, this is a, like that label is such a bit, is such an institution and it's, you know, it moves with all of these different things yeah. in mind. So it just became time for me to do things, you know, independently. And so we've talked about that. Um, but man, there are so many, so many things that I that I, I would mean, like even, to do. Even your, hey bro, even just you being in Istanbul now, to me, will be a fascinating story. Yeah. Like how you got there and like, what are you doing there? You know I mean? Like, like I want to know, brother. I, I, see I mean, it. so does so does so does the so does the FBI and so do the uh, <laughs> so do the people every t so does the TSA and so does the they're all there. What are you doing? But, but you I mean, know what I'm saying? Like, but, man, because I, because I just I love that. Like, I'm gonna tell you, I seen um I seen Omar at the World Cup, mm -hmm. like rapping. Yeah, and I was like, yo, like I I really love those moments, right? Yeah. But I was like, I know this brother. He was sitting in a chair. Like, how is he killing it so hard sitting he, in a chair, hey, bro? And he's at the World Cup, and it's like, you know, they 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 try to limit us so much to like, yeah. Oh, you're if you're not, you know, if you don't got a song spinning in the Atlanta strip clubs, like you're not relevant in a sense. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like this brother is at the world. Like you might not know him. Yeah, but look at the international reach that he has. So I love that, and I Omar like Omar Effendim for the people listening. For the people listening, we're talking about Omar Effendim. Yeah, great yes. Syrian American artist, organizer who also has an amazing wife and like a hundred percent beautiful brother. I, I went, I went to the Arab American Museum in in Detroit, and I was like, I know that dude, right? That's Omar. Effendim. It was, it was just yeah. I, so like I said, I love seeing. You know, my my thing is media and like media portrayals, and I'm always thinking about how we're portrayed in media and how that shapes how people see us. Yeah. And so like I feel like you shatter so many um misconceptions that people have about hip hop and rappers. Like you shatter all of those. And so like your story being told and shared um is something that I think is is really important, man. You know the main thing for me though, brother, I appreciate that, man. That means a lot. That means so much. The main thing for me, the main challenge that I have with marketing myself or whatever is like, I don't know, unless I'm interacting with people in a room, I never know what people's under, like what people think of me or what I'm doing. Like I never, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and I think part of it is my vision. Part is being uh, like European American, but albino. And so, so many people think albinos are black, yeah. black and white people think that. And then also being Muslim and being a hip hop artist and people think that Muslims are black. And then, you know what I mean? So I like, I never know until somebody says something about me. Like I never know when women like me, I never know. You know what I'm saying? Unless yeah, yeah, it's somebody yeah. like you or Amir Suleiman or like there are certain people that like, I'm like, man, we're the same person. You know what I mean? Like 100%. there's some people yeah. that I feel so comfortable with that, you know, but that's a that's a select group of people. Outside of that, I, I don't have any sense of what people think of me unless they're cheering for me at a show or being like, hey, will you help me become a Muslim? You know what I'm saying? Or, or something like that. I just... I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna tell you. I think. I think that what. So I think you have these different. I think this is what makes you such a powerful person, right? Because you have people that are, you know, that that met you as a battle rapper. That's like, yo, Ali was a murderer. You know what I'm saying? Like a battle rap. You know what I mean? That know you from that, right? 
and see you in that. Or some people that are like, yo, I'm a fan. I'm a Ali music fan. I love his community organizing. I love how I love, you know, the interviews that he does. I love, you know what I'm saying? So like when you tell your story, you actually bring those communities together. You know what I'm saying? Around like your whole story brings so many different communities. And now you have an international community where you're staying right now. Because yeah. I'm a, I'm just going to, so, I mean, I know you as a person, I'm sure you're building community where you are. And I think like, you know, you know, like, so I think there's a, a, lot, a lot of people don't know your breath, right? Because they know you in moments, right? But they don't right. know, yeah. like, I might, like, I might have known you from like the joint that you, oh yeah, Ali, man, I always go to this joint on Spotify, but they don't know what you're doing now. And that if they saw like, you know, if they on Netflix and seeing like, oh, Ali, and saw the breadth of your story, I think people would be amazed, brother, because like I'm, I'm constantly inspired, you know what I'm saying, by, how, but I, I know why, because I know you're, you're, you know, it's like you're connected to the universe in a different way. So I know why you're always innovating, right? Um, and you're always doing things that are so unique and different. And even, you know, the, the past project, even how you put out those projects, I thought were really, really creative and unique um, and how you're doing it. Um, so I, like I said, I, I, that's, that's how I feel. I feel like you end up, I'm going to tell you what one of the things that when we were doing a protest, I rapped at a, a thing and people was like, oh, we didn't know you rap. Like people had no idea. They just, just saw me as necessary for one hood. They didn't even know I had this whole career as an artist. You know, they, they might be 18, yeah. 19 years old. You know what I'm saying? And so like a very it's serious like, career. Like you, you, you have inspired the, some of the people that they probably love and listen to. A hundred percent. And so it's like, oh, well, I could share a story with you. And it's like, oh, I didn't know you had this this background and stuff. And I think, like I said, man, I, I don't, I'm not, you know, I mean, obviously I'm on a thing with you, but I'm not, I'm not saying it's just because I'm on a thing. I think you have one of the most unique, like, like stories in hip hop. You know what I'm saying? You have such, and, I, and I'm seeing, you know, I, I think like now, you know, people are like, if you're seeing documentaries, you're seeing stories about folks. Um, this is one of the reasons I used to love Combat Jack as a um, podcaster oh, because it was like yeah, he, he would, it was like a movie. He's it was like, best. yeah, it was like you would watch a movie the way he would interview people. And I just think like, you're a bro, your life is a movie. You got a little, you got a mini series, <laughs> you got a series um, in you that is super fascinating. Mm, I think that's part of what I'm trying to do with the podcast. Yes. Is just because I because all the people that I talk to, there's only a few that I've been like, we don't know each other, but would you come on my podcast? Um, there's that, that's very, very few. Most of the people that I talk to are people such as yourself, where it's like, man, for people to 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 know the pe just get a sense of the people that I know, the people who make me what I am. Yeah. Cause in a lot of ways, like I'm a collection of I'm 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 like an orphan. You know what I'm saying? Like I've I've been adopted and loved and cared for and trained and then worked alongside and I've been served and I've I, I've been of service hopefully and mm -hmm. you know so that's for, for part of it is that but then the other thing is like you, you saying this to me you know it's like it has to be somebody like you to say it because of how much I respect yeah. and admire you and. So you saying that to me means a lot. Like that really goes a long way for me. And I, I will and, say and I, that. And I think, bro, like, and like you said, I don't know if it's, like you said, you know, because you're Muslim, because you're Iban. I always, like, I always see you. And I still, I mean, I don't, you can call you yourself, whatever you want. In my mind, I see you as black. I see you as like, like, because like culture, like, like you're me. You see what I'm saying? So I always see you like that. I don't see you as separate from myself. You know what I'm saying? My favorite story of our interaction was when we did a song, one, you know mm. what I'm saying? We did a song called Pillars. Yeah. And um, and I remember, you know, again, like, um, my personality is like, I don't bother somebody. Like, I just, you know, we, we just, I just said, um, we just did this interview uh, with, with Kerry Washington in, in Philadelphia. And it was at Mark Lamar Hill's coffee shop and he told me he said man he answered the phone when i called he said because i had called him in five years like i'm kind of like lead people <laughs> he was kind of like well i knew yeah, if he was calling me it's something it means something right so um 
But um, so that was actually the producer religion. He said, man, you should holler at Brother Ali on this. I said, oh, yes. I mean, it's a good enough beat. I sent it to you. You took the song in a totally different way than even I perceived it. It's crazy to me. I mean, the verse is so... And then you did the little thing to the boogie. Say, oh, just. So then I took that part. Then I say, like, hey, man, can we do the video? And you were about to go on tour. Mm-hmm. And you were like, okay, I'm going on tour the next day. I'm in L.A. We go there. And then we're like, okay, we're going to Skid Row. And you were like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then my man, my man lit this torch. Hey, can you hold this torch? Yeah, okay, cool. Like, and it was just like, you never, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking like, yo, I don't know if Ali is going to, and just your, 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 you know, your humility, your love, your willingness to do that. You never came across as like, I'm uncomfortable. I'm not feeling this. Like you roll with it. And um, I just was like, this, this brother's different. You know what's crazy is like, so there, there was a Muslim sister that hit me up recently, and I was just talking about like the the Minneapolis music scene went through for lack of a I don't like the term cancel culture, but there was like, yeah. um, you know, there was a conversation that happened on Twitter during the height of the pandemic and right after the uprising over George Floyd, and in part of that conversation, so like I don't relate to the idea like inside of myself I don't relate to the idea of whiteness at all. Like I don't have a, so to me, it's like, it's like money. So like, I know money isn't real. I don't love money, but I, but I know that money is a reality. It's a social reality. And so I want to be um, responsible with it and I want to be responsible about it. So if there's anything that a white person should do, I'm like, I'm, I'm down to do that. But in terms of like relating to it, but, but there was a Muslim sister that hit me up that was like, I need you to stop calling yourself white. That's triggering for me. <laughs> she, she was like, because I've known you since you were 15 years old and we raised you and we trained you and we said, and when you I say you're right. white, she's that, that is like, that's like taking yeah. you from us. Like, that's like, that's like a, yeah. an adopted kid trying to go find their, yeah. uh, their birth parents to see if it's better in their house or yeah. something. No. She's like, you, I need you to you stop saying that. And I'm yeah, like, no, dude. I, I agree. I'm like, I ain't jacking that. No, you with us. But yeah, but then on, on the other side, you know, there are people that don't know me that are like, well, brother Ali, I, when Rachel Dolezal happened, I was like, somebody's going to say, this is what I did. I knew that I'm like, man, this is coming. This, this is th- me and this woman are gonna have some. No, they didn't. Oh yeah, and that was the that was the thing when people, people said that. Yeah, yeah, no, but yeah. Oh no, that's the number one. If you were to say like, what is the critique of of Brother Ali? Is that they say that I lied and said that I was black, and I didn't do that. But on the other hand, if somebody doesn't know me and doesn't know the community I come from, I understand. And I also understand, and like I, I understand too that there are people who listen to me for ten. years. There are black people who listen to me for ten years, and then realize like, wait, so he's not black, and that they feel a certain way. And I yeah I yeah you like no, nah, but not again. And I, like I said, and I and I and I feel that, but it's like not to me. You know what I'm saying? And and then I think like yeah. it's it's certain people, bro. Like, um, you know that that have that build such a respect. Cause like now I be I you know when you said somebody said that about me, my thing my then I then I get into the hood like who said that where they what's 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 I mean I mean what because I mean you always you, bro in every scenario that I've ever seen you you showed up as authentically yourself and with love and with community and support and it's like that's rare like I don't think people understand how rare that is um, and like so I think like for me man like. You, you like the, 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 the respect, the love, the support that you get is because of how you show up. And like I said, your connection to your where you're from, hip hop, the universe, all of that, man. So, yeah. So, you know, you definitely have been somebody that has used your platform to bring folks together and not alienate folks, man, and really dismantle a lot of that man, stuff. Coming from you, that means everything, you, you know. Hey, bro. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Appreciate I you. I love you, brother. Love you. you know what I'm You're saying? one of the and, people um, that just, you being in the world makes me feel like maybe I'm not crazy and maybe we're, maybe we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right, brother. You already know, man. Man, so much love and gratitude for my dear brother, Jasiri X. Shout out to the great Celeste. Shout out to Paradise Gray, to Wiz Khalifa, to the whole 
crew out there in Pittsburgh, man. We love them very, very much, and we're very grateful to be connected with them. I want to thank my brother Jasiri for being so generous with his time. We sat for a couple of hours like we always do. Um, you probably heard the invitation, and um, I can't wait to come back to One Hood. So a uh, special shout out to them just for being so generous uh, with his time and his insight and his wisdom and his stories and everything. It just means so much. Um, head to betterhelp.com slash travelers. When you do that, you get a discount and we get a commission for having connected, making make that connection. Uh, check out Zakat Foundation. Dot org. Check out Zakat US and get down with what they're doing. Head to brotherali.com, sign that mailing list. Make sure you like, share, subscribe. All that stuff matters a lot. You comment, you rate, any way to engage, it really does help the podcast grow. And um, as always, we're grateful for you being here. Special thanks to Emna Mirza and to Mansur Panawala and to DJ Last Word and to Shane Atkinson and Aida Rashid and to Sage Francis and all the people that even just give me feedback on the podcast. Special uh, love to my man, Ahmed Fahmi, who uh, gives me feedback on this podcast as well. Very grateful for all of y'all. Uh, special thanks to Mark from Medina Hip Hop, who created the logo for this podcast. Go to Medina Hip Hop, check out all the stuff that they do there. And uh, as always, this program is produced by the one and only my dear brother, my collaborator, my friend, Brendan Kelly, a.k.a. BK1, and it is a production of Traveler's Media. Um, I love you. And uh, what else can we say beyond that? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace.